so I'll go ahead and call the meeting to order for Wednesday, August 5th. It's a little bit past our start time, but that's okay. And uh, I'm going to start off, uh, Chief Speaker, I just wanted to say something quickly about the phone line service to the police and fire station. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, just wanted to let the residents know that we are experiencing uh, issues with our non-emergency phone numbers at the public safety complex. Uh, Verizon has been notified and they are getting us uh, back online as quick as possible. However, I just want to advise everyone that we have set up uh, two temporary phone lines with our new uh, new wireless equipment that we received as part of a state grant. And I have those two phone numbers that I'd like to give to you. They are also uh, on the town website and we also sent out a Nixel alert to everyone. So you should have that info. But the two numbers that you can call until further notice are 413-588-8316 or 413-588-8564. And this is just for non-emergency numbers, uh, just non-emergency calls. Uh, our 911 system is still up and running completely as normal. So if you have an emergency related to fire, police, or EMS, use that service. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chief. All right, so we'll get started with the consent agenda. We have a whole lot of warrants to go through. We have minutes from March 20. Uh, and real quick, if I could just remind everybody, if you're not speaking, please keep your uh, Zoom on mute, just so we don't get a lot of background noise. But we have uh, warrants WP2052R, WP2053, WP2053R, WP2053S, WP2053S-2, WP2053S-3, WP2054, WP2054-2, WP2054S, AP2101, AP2102, AP2103, AP2104, AP2105, AP2106, AP2106-2, and PR2106S. And that's plenty. Um, we have the DPW completion of a probationary period for Wade Vandalowski, Hadley Police Lieutenant uh, MOU for uh, Mitch Cook, Hadley Dispatch Supervisor MOU for Megan Cahill, Historical Commission resignation for Ginger Goldsberry, Municipal Building Committee resignation for David Tudrin, Municipal Building Committee and Russell School Subcommittee Building Committee resignation for Claire Carlson, Texas Roadhouse Entertainment License, Water and Sewer Commitments, FY 2020 first quarter, the select board will sign them, Permit Link Services Agreement, uh, select board will ratify that. Waiver of fire department fees associated with fundraising event at Hampshire Mall for whole children, August 14th. Select board will approve that. Could I have a motion? I can make a motion to approve. I just wanted to set aside the dispatch supervisor MOU. I just had a question on that. Okay, we'll pull that out. Any others? Yes. I'll second that. Okay. All right. And All those in favor. I, yeah. And could I, we should also um, thank people publicly that have served on these um, committees, uh, David Tudrin, uh, Ms. Carlson, and uh, Ginger Goldsberry from all of the committees and time that they have put into this. They certainly have been an asset to these committees and spent a lot of time with them and we'd like to thank them uh, very much for participating and hopefully someday they might rejoin us. Right. And I have one quick uh, correction that Sue just notified me of. The water and sewer commitments are for FY 2021. Uh, okay. first. So just to be clear on that. Okay. So we have a motion. And All right. there's, a, there's a note on Texas Roadhouse also. There's a what? A, a note on uh, Texas Roadhouse for a grease trap repair that you need to make. Okay. Uh, we were just discussing it. All right, so we'll pull Texas Roadhouse out as well. All right. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Aye. Aye, except for uh, DPW. Okay. Aye. All right, so let's take care of the dispatch supervisor MOU. Christian, what'd you have? I just saw that in the lieutenant's MOU, uh, there was a 3% salary deviation over the sergeant or something like that, the union contract. And I didn't know if we wanted to have some kind of language like that in the dispatch supervisor's um, MOU. So uh, thank you for asking that question, uh, Christian. The, the reason that we didn't do this thing with the dispatch supervisor is because there really isn't any comparable um, salaries within the dispatch union that would have made any sense to do it the same way that we did the lieutenant one. So we're going to continue to keep her, um, any increases she gets will be determined by the board, um, like any other non-union uh, employees, but it just made a little bit more sense for Mitch because that top step sergeant was actually making more money than he was. So we just wanted to make the adjustment to make sure that that doesn't ever cross anymore. Um, but with the dispatch supervisor, there isn't anybody close to her. Um, so it didn't make a lot of sense to do the same. Okay. And I was going to ask you that offline, but I just wanted to make sure it was, it was fair. That was all. Yep. It, it, yeah. There was a reason for it. So thanks for asking. All right. Okay. I can just make a motion to approve that just so we can get that taken care of. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And then uh, we have the Texas Roadhouse Entertainment License. John, what did you have for that? Uh, for the last uh, two inspections that I've done over there over the last six months, three months intervals, uh, they've had a broken pipe in one of the uh, grease trap, external traps that needs to be addressed. Uh, I had left cards and contact numbers for them, and we had just sent them a letter uh, two weeks ago, and he still hasn't responded. So, Okay, so maybe we could get a motion to approve that contingent upon their required grease trap repairs? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm going to abstain from that. I'm involved okay. in that. Sounds good. Um, let's skip down to, because they have a dead time deadline, um, haikus along the dike. Uh, Michelle Friedman, I believe, is here. It's Dina. Hi. Oh, sorry. <laughs> You're getting me mixed up with the other Friedmans. Hi. So <laughs> thanks for taking this early, David. I appreciate it. <laughs> so um, basically, we put a proposal into the select board. I'm, I'm speaking from the Hadley Cultural Council. And um, John Rollinson, who's also on the Cultural Council, put a proposal into the select board to see if we could have the haikus that were so successful on the bike path be placed on the dike for about three to four weeks. And um, we're totally happy to coordinate with the mowing schedule. We can put them up right after they mow and if they need to mow in between, if they let us know, as long as they let us know, give us a little bit of notice, we can certainly take them down, have them mow, put them back, put them back up. So um, I'm just happy to answer any questions about it. There are about 11 lawn signs. We would put them on the town in town owned portion of the dike, spread them out. Probably some would be facing the river and some would be going around the corner um, towards Cemetery Road. So that's um, pretty much the, the idea. And um, people really like them on the bike path. And we just felt this was the best place where the most people would see them. I don't have a problem with them. I think they're a good thing. I think people enjoy them, but I just, I think you just need to work with the DPW and thank you for suggesting that. So I, I guess that would be my motion is to uh, accept those for the dike path and uh, but have uh, Dina work with the DPW on mowing and doing what you need to do for that. Dina. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I do apologize for not getting back to you. I did get your uh, telephone message, but I've been quite busy with this storm at work. So. But I am for that. I don't have no problem with that. Can I just get a second for that motion? I, I can second. Okay. Um, so, Dina, I will 
speak with Chris on Friday and I'll let you know what the okay. morning schedule looks like and okay. when we can get them up. Okay. Um, so any further discussion? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thanks, Dina. Thank you so much. Um, next is public comments, limited to 15 minutes and three minutes per person. Anybody here for public comments? Yes, I am. Andy, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, hi everybody. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yep. Thanks for inviting me to uh, address the select board uh, concerning the CPA uh, new appointments. Um, I think I have to begin, you know, by apologizing um, not only for not getting my letter in on time, uh, but for being uh, so upset about losing my position on the committee um, because it really meant a lot to me uh, to be on that committee and to work with everybody on the committee. Uh, I really thought my appointment was up next year and that I had another year to, um, another year to serve. And I don't really have an excuse other than I got the, the year mixed up. Uh, you know, I don't want to use my heart attack as an excuse. Um, maybe I would have remembered and I don't know, maybe not. Um, but the reason why it bothers me so much is because the CPA committee was working really well. Uh, I felt like I was doing great work and I loved working with everybody in town, the school department and park and rec and uh, DPW and getting these uh, worthy proposals funded and helping the applicants get to yes. That was definitely the most rewarding part, the part I'll miss the most. Uh, the hardest part though was, uh, you know, as chairman, you have to tell people that their proposals aren't ready, uh, that they're not applicable, that it's not a permissible use of CPA funds. Uh, and having to stand up for the integrity of the committee and the process brought me into conflict with a lot of people in town. I understand that. Uh, and you guys sometimes. Um, I always tried to work things out um, beforehand. Um, and uh, that's something, um, uh, that's something I'm, I'm not going to miss. But I felt that I owed my best effort to protect the people's money and the integrity of the CPA process. Um, as time goes by, the economy gets worse, it's going to be more and more tempting to use that money in ways for which it was not intended. Um, and uh, um, the, the CPA needs a strong chair um, in order to make sure that the rules are followed and that everybody is treated fairly. Uh, I think I did that as chair. Uh, it was very important to me. And from the feedback that I've gotten, you know, I know that I succeeded in doing that. Uh, I modeled myself after the two previous chairs, Joe Fitzgibbons and uh, Edwin Matusko, two people who I really came to um, uh, admire. Uh, their integrity and their fairness uh, to everyone. Um, I tried to model myself after them. Although one thing I didn't do that they did was that they were, you know, kind of paranoid about how the money was going to be used. And I'm not a paranoid person. I trust people generally. I think most people do the right thing if given enough time. Um, and so I feel that the CPA needs a strong chair and Hadley needs a strong uh, CPA. And so I'm asking the select board to give me a second chance and to reappoint me and let me serve on the committee uh, in the way I did before. Uh, there's a lot of projects out there and a lot of good work left to do. And um, I want to have the opportunity to do it and serve the town in the way that I have in the past. So I hope that you'll give me a second chance. Uh, I also want to thank all the people who supported me and reached out to me uh, and told me that I was doing a good job and that they, uh, um, uh, they wanted me to continue to have a place on the committee. I really appreciate the support, the support of everyone. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Andy. Anybody else have a comment? If you uh, would like to publicly comment, please uh, turn your camera on, wave, or speak up somehow so we know. Okay. okay, last call. Um, there, there's one person who called me who's trying to get on, and I'm trying to help him, but I don't know if he's going to manage. Is that for public comment? 
Yes. Okay. If he does get on, we'll make an exception and come back for that person. Okay. Okay. Hey, thank you. Sure. I just like to make a comment. I, I think it's uh, an unfortunate um, occurrence that happened. Um, I think with all of COVID and all of our uh, everything that people have been having to put up with, it's kind of hard to keep track of everybody's um, time or whatever they need to re-up or things like that. And I think it just goes to show that we need you know, people to be aware of when their uh, term is up. And I do think, Andy, you've been very uh, active and uh, a good person on the CPA. I do appreciate appreciate all your service. Um, unfortunately, now that you we have put other people in place here, it's kind of hard to say, is there another spot on the committee? I don't know, is there David or not? Is there an alternate um, that Andy could fill or not at this point to still be a part of that committee. Um, what what are the thoughts on that, David? What's what's the what's the ruling on that to add any people or whatever we're doing to the CPA? You're asking me, David Nixon. Yeah, you look like okay. a good person to ask. All right, so uh, CPA is uh, established by town meeting vote and by bylaw, and it has a, a set membership of nine. Um, the way to get an, an additional person on could it be either as an alternate or if you change the okay. plan, like a special town meeting, okay. you could uh, expand the membership. And you have to do that through town meeting. So have they made it? Have they made a decision of any kind? Is that how you have to do it, David, through town meeting? To change the number of people on the committee, it needs to, uh, you need to amend the bylaw. If you wanted to appoint somebody as an uh, alternate, that's that's doable. Um, is that a possibility? My other board members? So, Hello? Yeah, are you there, Joyce? Yeah. All right. Uh, so um, I'll just quickly, uh, Andy did a, you did a good job when you're on this, on the CPA committee and as chair, the, uh, where I don't see myself voting for you as an alternate right now is because of your behavior after our appointment, showing up at people's houses, asking them to resign, uh, so that way you could remain chair, sending letters about how the select board has a, some sort of vendetta against you. Um, you know, it, it's, I'm, I'm hearing it from all sorts of places when the best path would have been to reach out to myself as chair. Uh, I'm pretty, pretty reachable text, email, phone, pretty much 24 seven, as people will tell you. And, uh, unfortunately that was never done. And the behavior after the fact, it, it just kind of makes me doubt supporting you going forward for a position like that. And um, so I, I have some real concerns about how you handled yourself afterwards, almost intimidating a person that we just appointed to, uh, to the position by showing up at their house in the middle of a pandemic with their kids in the yard. So I have some concerns. Can I respond to that? Sure. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, I did go talk to Cassandra after trying to reach her on the phone and sent her a letter uh, with my point of view. Uh, her kids were in the house. I was wearing a mask. We kept six feet apart. I am not intimidating. I did not intimidate her. Uh, I did ask her to withdraw. I didn't ask for her answer. Uh, I told her if she wanted to talk to me, she could. I have had no um, interactions with her since. I don't know what she decided. Um, I reject that I went there to intimidate her. If you can't go and talk to a neighbor in Hadley anymore, what do we come to? I would also ask, why didn't you call me? You could have called me and asked me, and I would have told you that I was still interested in serving. I did reach out to other members of the select board, but David, I didn't call you. Yeah, we, we don't typically reach out to committee members or appointed individuals to remind them that their term is up. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to speak if possible. 
Um, I, I'm an interested party, but I will comment that the meeting was held on July 8th. It is totally by accident that we found out that Andy um, was voted out of his CPA com, um, position. Somebody from another committee called us last week, middle or end of last week, and said, well, now that Andy is no longer in the CPA, the person asked me, um, would he be interested in this other committee? So between July 8th and the end of July, we had no idea this, this had happened. And in fact, somebody who used to be a committee member told the CPA committee, the central, the, the state CPA committee, that he was no longer the chair before we even knew that. So there are communication issues um, in town hall. We weren't expecting, you know, Andy takes responsibility for not tracking. I have to say in the past, he always had a reminder call. I also have to say timing and calendar stuff is not his fort. And I take care of that. And I was um, pretty ill for most of June and July. Um, so I, I, I was um, asleep on my duties that way or the way I help out. And Andy was very preoccupied with helping me. Some people know about this and some people don't. Um, I just think communication is key. And I know we're all in a lot with COVID, but um, you know, th really, in the next two days after that meeting, he should have gotten a call. So I, I will say, yes, we failed in our notification of, uh, of, of you, Andy, after the fact. Um, that's one of the things that unfortunately has kind of slipped through the cracks with everything going on. Um, and as a, uh, the professional thing would have been to have you notified immediately. So I do apologize the fact that you were not notified. Um, you shouldn't have been finding out about that from a, a third party. So I do want to apologize for that. May I say something? Sure. Yeah, uh, this is Shell Horowitz. And I have served on appointed bodies both uh, during my years in Northampton and also no, during the 22 years that I have lived in Hadley. And as I recall, in both of those communities, whenever my term was going to expire, I received notice. Um, I'm also very, I'm sorry? I don't know who's interrupting me here. Um, but uh, quit unmuting yourself. I'm unmuted. Um, someone else is unmuting and causing feedback. Yeah. A anyway, I, I just, think that when you have somebody who's doing an effective job and who both he and his wife have overlapping health crises and thinking about when their appointment uh, expires may not be top of mind when basic survival was at stake. I, I think there was some definite courtesy absent here. And I, I think that the town should look for some ways to make it right to him. This well, the only way, the only way that we can well, let me just see here. Hello, this is Peter Malady. I can't get my video to work. Can I make a public comment? In a moment, please. Hold on, sir. Joyce, you had something? Or no? Uh, not yet, no. Oh, okay. I do, David. You know, okay. I've been running for the select board now for three terms, uh, working on seven years. You know, if I didn't want to run, I, I had plenty of time to decide on my own. An appointed position and an elected position are kind of the same thing. Uh, Andy, I apologize. Uh, I, I do, uh, did know that you had some health issues, you and your wife, and I assumed, of course I didn't contact you, but I assumed that uh, you probably didn't want to run because of your personal matters. So. Again, this is Peter Malady. May I make a comment? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, this seems to be rather unfortunate. Uh, I'd like to say that I've made several submissions over the past several years to the CPA. I've been struck 
with the fairness, the honesty, and the integrity in which I was treated, both in accordance with the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And in times like these, where even the Mass Registry of Motor Vehicles can make exceptions and give you an extension on your application for a, a license plate, I think we, we could do something like that. Wisdom is the ability to discover alternatives. I think maybe we ought to consider some alternatives in this case. It would be a shame to lose the experience and the dedication that Andy has brought to this committee. Thank you. Thank you. Any further last comments before we move on? I just want to say one thing real quick is that I do appreciate Andy's service and, you know, we did try to delay the decision and I just hope that this doesn't discourage other people from participating in boards and committees and maybe we can um, do something in the future to, uh, you know, notify people or whatnot and... <laughs> And I, I do feel bad for Andy because of the health circumstances and not giving notice. So um, that's all I want to say. But maybe we can implement something uh, in the future. Yeah, as, as my understanding is, at least in the last five years, there hasn't been any outreach when a term is up from a appointed position or a volunteer position, uh, I guess. Previous, previously before that, there, there was letters that went out, um, but about five years ago, long before I was here, that, that stopped. So if that's something that we want to start up again going forward, then I'm sure we can do that without an issue. Uh, we just need to decide, you know, what we want to start. So to do yeah, David, we're, and we're always campaigning throughout the year for different boards and committees because we're always short. And now we're in a predicament where we have too many people on the committee who are interested in this committee. So. Well, we just had two resignations from two other committees that are very important to the town, the building committee, uh, master building committee that David Tudor was on. Um, certainly, you know, and the, and his, the uh, historical commission. So there are some others if anybody else, if Andy would like to participate in either one of those, that would be fine. Back to your other suggestion, I think that we should, as a board, get some kind of policy so that we do have a, a place where we notify people that their volunteer term is going to expire and they need to be reappointed and write a letter. And then we need to follow up and say, this is who was appointed. Communication has got to improve. Right, but that's too late for me. So I would like to ask if anyone would like to make a motion to reinstate me to the CPA committee. Uh, David. Oh. It's David M needs to quit unmuting himself or turn off his television before he tries to speak. That's okay. what it is. It's feedback. Okay. So I'd like to keep moving on, please, unless there's any last public comments from someone who hasn't used their three minutes. So, okay. Thank you everybody for your public comments and uh, for coming out tonight. Uh, next on the agenda is town hall reopening for early voting and election warrant. Uh, the town clerk needs to allow people to vote in person for early voting for both the primary, which is September 1st and the general election November 3rd. Voting occurs in town hall. Early voting for the primary takes place Saturday, August 22nd through Friday, August 28th. Early voting for the general election takes place Saturday, October 17th through Friday, October 30th. The select board will sign the election warrant and the select board will review and take action on town hall and senior center reopening plan that features a phased return to work. The phases are based on the data about the pandemic. I know that uh, the clerk is here with us, I believe. So if David or uh, Jess Spanknable want to say anything, please feel free. So I'll take it. Uh, I'll take it right now. The um, 
the reopening plan I circulated for comments and I've just received a bunch of comments back this afternoon, which I haven't had a chance to incorporate it to a final document. So I'll do that and present that at your next meeting. Um, but we do have uh, early voting for the primary, August 2nd, 22nd through Friday, August um, 28th. And that has to happen in town hall, as I understand it. Jessica, you can uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So we need at least permission to open town hall for um, voting on that early voting period. And we need to open up the senior center for the September 1st uh, primary. Can we, can we do a, um, like we have at the hospital, we have COVID tenting for drive up um, to do, get your COVID testing. Is there any way that we could do a tenting um, on the property at town hall, say in the front where people would drive up and do their voting, not get out of their car, have their masks on um, and do the voting that way so that they would not have to come into town hall. That would be my suggestion. And I just wanted to run that by Jessica to see if that would be feasible or not. I personally would not feel comfortable doing that um, given the amount of early voting mail-in applications I've received. I'm not hey, Jessica, could, could you get a little closer to the microphone? I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry, you want me to start over? Or? Yes, please, please do. Okay. Um, I'm not fond of the idea that Joyce brought forth. Um, I, my concern is that we've received so many mail-in applications for the early voting that I would not anticipate a heavy traffic in a town hall. I think this actually gives the perfect opportunity to do kind of like a test run to allow a few people in at a time. Um, we're already at probably 25 to 30% of voters that have requested ballots for that election. So I'm not anticipating a rush of people coming into town hall. And again, when if we have the one entrance, one exit, I'm working with Mike now on kind of a flow plan for it. Other offices who don't feel comfortable having people in town hall since we're closed, the public can simply shut their doors. I guess that's why I suggested the, the tenting is that uh, people would be able to just come up, do their voting and, and leave uh, without having to worry about going into a building. Um, you know, all I, get, I get that. But there's also other considerations as far as, you know, the weather not always cooperating. Uh -huh. I have to log every person that comes to vote in the state computer, which I don't have access if I'd be off site. Mm -hmm. You have a portable uh, laptop? Yeah, but it doesn't have the state computer on it. Without okay. It. All right. It's I didn't know that. For people to, I mean, you know how hard it is when you're in the car to write something down, never mind yep. properly cast a ballot. Yeah. Um, okay. you know, these, yeah, and that's that's good. I mean, I'm just asking questions that were running through my mind today, Jessica. So thank you. Yeah, I, I read through it and I just I don't feel with our elderly population that we have that we should reopen the town hall too soon. Uh, it's just like having a meeting. I mean, we had one at the uh, new senior center, but I, I'm just not in favor of that right now at this point. And yeah. this was this is. I was going to say too, real quick. I'm not really a fan of opening up town hall, especially starting on August 22nd, because that's when UMass, I believe, starts back up. So, you know, I really think we have to be cautious with an influx of students coming into the area and opening up town hall at the same time. And but the town hall. What, what other options do we have for this early voting? I know it's the only spot, but. Can people just come into the, the front entryway and vote there or something so they're not walking through town hall? Not handicapped accessible. Could, could we just be open to the people that wanted to vote and nobody else? So there'd be just a one, one direction flow in and out. Okay. That seems like a good uh, And somebody else had made a suggestion, and I, I agree with it, that limiting the number of people that are into town hall, but it's almost like having to get a volunteer to make sure the numbers it's like uh, it's like the Walmart or the big Y, you know, how they're 
tracking how many numbers are in and how many numbers are out. Um, you know, so we want to make sure that we don't have overcrowding in the town hall because people are going to come in for other businesses unless you're just going to open the town's clerk office and not anything else. Are we doing openings in phases where we're just going to be doing the town clerk at first uh, to get the voting done? Um, have we have we decided on that yet? I think we're talking about two different things at the same time. Let's talk about the early voting and get that out of the way because I think that's an easier solution. And then we can talk about the town hall, whether we want to open or not. Um, well, that's that goes with it, David. I just wanted to be sure that the two of them weren't coinciding. Yeah. So, okay. so that if we're just going to open town hall for voting, that's a different thing. And so, that's not having people come into the other offices. Uh, Jess, is there... I mean, what, what's the plan? Is it one person at a time coming in your office to vote? Is that how you do it? Or, or what, what are your plans? I mean, we could restrict it to like two people at a time. I'm going to have two booths set up. I am perfectly amenable to having just my office open. And anyone else who does not feel comfortable can close their doors. We can put notice out that it's for voting only. Okay. So the, the rule is, is six feet apart. Everybody is wearing a mask. So people, two people can't fit into your office. So the stations would have to be set up in the hall, correct? Joyce, the, we're putting the, so we would be doing a similar flow plan as to what we did at Hopkins, only okay. a much, uh, smaller scale. So yeah. if you remember that it's, we'll, we'll definitely, and also with the town election. So there yeah. would only be, there would, we would not exceed, people would not be closer than six feet. There would literally just be two voter booths yeah available if yep. they're coming together if they're together as a family just as we did with the town election they mm -hmm. can come in together because those voter booths are set up for four yep. however they would be you know if it's an individual person it would only be two at a time we would have staff there again uh to assist with deconning after each person comes through and we would have the same flow plan with one entry in and we would make sure that the door is propped open or being properly deconned and then flowing out again. Okay. All right. So it's going to be basically set up the same way, which is, is doable. Um, you did a great job at Hopkins. I appreciate that. Um, so I just want to make sure that that's what it is, six feet apart. And you have to count the number of people you're going to have in there at a time because you don't want to exceed that number. Correct. We wouldn't allow more than the two going in because we'd only have two booths going up. Like unless, like we said, it was you know a family, so a couple of yep. two. So yeah. Those two would go in and be at one booth, and then a single person go to, to go to the second. We would okay. set up the tables for check in and check no, out no, whatever it's needed. Uh, apparently, there's no need for that now, so um, it okay. should be pretty straightforward. The only logistical part is having everybody else that's in the bu building comfortable. And if they needed to come out and use the restroom or, uh, you know, travel somewhere, they could put their mask on and we could limit access of who's coming in at that time. Yeah. Okay. All right. That, that sounds good. That sounds like a good plan. So Sue had something to say and I also Dr. Mosler's here. I'm sure she might have something to say as well. Yeah. My only concern is that water bills will be due at the same time this is going on. And people, even if the door is closed, people will knock on the door and say, you're right here. Can you please take this? I believe Mike is going to have somebody stationed at the door because obviously I can't stand by the door and do the voting at the same time. So I believe part of the plan is having somebody there, making sure the people come in are there only for voting. And that works, Jess. We'll direct them, Sue. If anybody comes in for your bills, we'll direct them to your Dropbox. Thank you. So and we'll if anybody sure. comes in to vote, I, I, if, you're, if your folks can just make sure to let them know that my office isn't open. Yes, we're there, but... They'll use a Dropbox. Yeah. Correct, for now. Yes, we can set up we can set up partitions so that there's a clear pathway to the voting area, um, so that it's not impacting your spaces. Portable uh, block offs. Yep. 
any other well, the election went off well and the town meeting went off well i'm sure you're gonna handle it mike yeah town meeting was good you did a good job have faith in you any other comments about Some, if somebody needs an accessible entrance and exit then the one-way strategy kind of goes away so what we had to make a couple exceptions for that yeah. as well at the annual town election so the one or two exceptions we have to make Obviously, I can always tell the person outside not to let anyone else in because they're going to have to use that same entrance. And again, I'm not anticipating a huge flux of walk-in, in-person voting. I believe it is completely manageable. November okay. might be a different story. Yeah. And maybe, and maybe things will change by November where we can hold it someplace else at that point. Anything from the right. health to chime in on this or no? Do we need a motion or not? Are we all set just to say yay or nay? Uh, I guess we'll make a motion just to be safe. I'll make a motion to uh, have uh, our chief bank enable and town clerk set up uh, the necessary voting booths that we need for the early primary and uh, allow them to uh make the rules on what needs to be done. I'll second it. Mr. Chair, could I just add one comment that we will make sure that this goes through unified command and that everybody's aware of the plan like we did with the election? Yes, I think you are I think you have a meeting next Monday, Mike, correct? That's correct. Um, I'm not sure if we'll have it set up complete by then, but we'll certainly have a meeting to make sure that everybody is on board and agrees with it. So if we have to adjust, we will. That's fine, thank you. Any further discussion? Dr. Moser, somebody unmute Dr. Moser. Hold on, Dr. Moser, we can't hear you. Unmute Dr. Moser. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Uh, I, I just wanted to chime in also that I think uh, the chief really did an excellent job with both uh, the election and, uh, and the town meeting. And uh, I'm sure he will do the same with, uh, with our early voting. And I'm glad he's going to have you involved at the meeting on next Monday so that everybody was on the same page. Yes, we will be there. Thank you. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So now let's go on to the stickier one, which is uh, opening the town hall for business to some degree at some point. Um, David, what's your what's your target date, and is there any flexibility there? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so what I would like to do is take a, another week and revise the plan based upon the feedback that I received from the department heads, uh, and then present that uh, to you at your next meeting. Uh, this is obviously going to have to be phased. We're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to be paying attention to the data. Um, and as Christian pointed out, things are going to be changing in the next couple of weeks with the colleges reopening and more traffic out of line and more uh, opportunities for people to uh, come in contact with the virus. So um, you take it on, take it under advisement right now. I'll have something uh, firmer to talk about uh, at your next meeting. Okay, sounds good. So we'll move on. Uh, uh oh, board docs is frozen. Um, okay, next we have COVID 19 update school request for CARES Act funds. Select board review the town had the response and plans for dealing with COVID 19. Dr. McKenzie, superintendent of schools, will present information about the plans to reopen Hadley Elementary and Hopkins Academy. Uh, Dr. McKenzie will request funds from the CARES Act allotment for Hadley to conduct needed work to improve air circulation at Hopkins Academy. Uh, the board will discuss safety provision uh, to protect the community. So Dr. McKenzie, take it away. Okay, I am actually going to, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Phil, great to be here. Thank you for the select board for having us and David Nixon for coordinating this. And I'm actually going to turn it over to the school committee chair and vice chair, uh, Heather Kleisch and Paul Pfeiffer who are on the call. Thanks, Annie. Um, and thank you to the select board for having us here. Um, just a few opening remarks about where we are in the process. Um, 
I'd like to thank Dr. Mosler and Jane Nevin Smith for being part uh, part of our meeting last week. And Jane, I know you've been on for prior meetings as well. We did meet July 30th, um, and we had a number of uh, public participants, which was great to see such a turnout um, and a very good uh, and informative public comment. We in a, that meeting on the 30th were able to present um, the three plans that we have in terms of. Uh, really what we've been asked to do, which is develop an in-person plan, 100% uh, remote plan, and a hybrid plan. And our meeting last week allowed us uh, to not only interact with the administration in terms of building specific plans for Hadley Elementary School, as well as Hopkins Academy, and be able to dialogue with the public around specific questions um, that did come up around air quality, around use of facilities such as gymnasiums as classrooms and how that might uh, impact air quality uh, around questions such as um, after school care or um, specifics about whether volunteers would be uh, allowed. So it was great to get that kind of um, public feedback in addition to the questions, the numerous questions that we've received over the last few months that the administration have worked hard to assemble. Um, so where we are now, is that we're gonna meet tomorrow, uh, 5.30 uh, tomorrow evening, and um, all parents have been notified of this through the um, district notification uh, communication tool, uh, and they've also received the Zoom invite, and we would encourage public to come. Uh, what we're going to do is continue that deliberation on the district fall reopening plan. Uh, we're gonna talk through the three different plans as well as any building specific um, comments, things that we recognize might be open and need to be addressed. Uh, and then ultimately we do need to vote on which plan will be in effect as of now uh, based on current public health data. And we're gonna stress that this is what we know as of now, uh, as of tomorrow evening. And we recognize things change uh, and we have a number of opportunities to come back um, and discuss those changes and discuss whether or not those may impact our future plans. Um, but the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education or DESE as you'll hear us call them, they do require that our school committee vote on which plan um, we intend to implement in the fall before August 10th. So we do need to move forward. I think families are welcoming some decision, whichever way that may go. Um, and I also recognize, just speaking from a, a parent's perspective, that there is no what, one right answer here. Um, we're gonna talk through everything that we have available to us and all of the considerations and ultimately vote on a plan. Um, we do have future meetings scheduled for August 24th and August 31st, and we'll schedule more if we need to. Um, this is obviously very important, and we also recognize that the landscape can change um, at any time. But ultimately, we do need to vote on the plan that we would recommend. So we're going to plan to do that tomorrow. And that recommendation may change if public health conditions change. We are going to have two public comments. I just want to make sure that folks are aware of that. So two public comment periods, one before we deliberate and another one after we deliberate and before we vote. We thought that it would be helpful to hear from the public then uh, yeah, have them have the opportunity to pose questions that may not have been answered yet, have us have the opportunity to deliberate that as a group, and then ultimately hear once more from the public before we take an action. Um, some of the other things we're gonna need to do are vote on a new start date for students. So um, this is related to DESE's action to give teachers 10 additional professional uh, development days and readiness days. So that new start date that we'll be voting on is September 14th. Um, and we'll also talk about school choice for this coming year and any adjustments that might need to be made. Uh, so going back to really the, the discussion that you had mentioned around um, CARES Act, really the highlight of this topic, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Paul and Annie to expand on this, but essentially these expenses that we're looking at are all things that are recommendations in terms of work that would need to be done to significantly reduce the risk associated with reopening school um, and thereby reducing the likelihood of widespread community transmission. Um, a, a large amount of this has to do with air quality, uh, HVAC inspection, repair, cleaning, and disinfection, which Paul uh, and Annie can elaborate on. 
So again, I'm going to turn it over to Paul and Annie, but I just want to thank everybody for um, their continued uh, involvement, support, uh, kind words, uh, questions. We welcome all of that. And so with that, uh, Annie? Yeah, uh, actually, Paul will be speaking about HVAC. I just want to clarify something because I sent an email earlier and you brought up school choice and I've alarmed families unnecessarily. The discussion the school committee will have about school choice is regarding unfilled slots that we have. If you are currently a school choice family in Hadley Public Schools, the school committee is not having any discussion about doing anything different for students and families that are currently enrolled. And just, that was a small aside. And Paul will talk about it. Thanks, Annie. Thanks, Heather. And thank you, Select Board, for taking the time to talk about this. So as Heather mentioned, really a lot of what we're asking for, we're, we're asking the, the town to approve <coughs> a commitment of earmarking uh, $223,000 of CARES Act money. And it really is all going to risk reduction strategies. And we're following the best guidance that's out there based from the, the CDC, EPA, there's um, some associations of HVAC professionals that have put out guidance that we're following. There's a Harvard documentation about healthy kids and healthy buildings that we're following. Um, you know, like this isn't a perfect science. The guidance isn't uh, as specific as I would like it to be. And we're dealing with what we have. And I think we're, we're putting together a pretty robust package. So Part of that 223,000 that you'll see is for PPE, of course, right? Those are the, the materials we're all gonna need, the masks and, and gloves and such and sanitizing equipment, additional desks to make sure everybody is, as much as we can down to the lower grades are staying six feet apart. We have uh, the room in our two buildings to accommodate everybody, uh, mostly up to six feet apart. And we've put together a pretty robust strategy to how we do that in, in different phases that we're, we've talked about. Uh, one thing that we're doing that other communities have done is we're ordering tents. So we'll have three tents, both for the elementary school and three tents for Hopkins. And so those, uh, of course, as weather permits, it's a way for the, the kids and the staff to get out, take their masks off. That's a, something that's gonna be essential, right? A planned mask breaks where folks are staying more than six feet apart and uh, getting exposed to outside air. Then some of the big ticket items are air exchange issues uh, internally. So you have air purifiers, and I've been doing a lot of work on um, where to, what we would get to, to that could purify air in each of the rooms. Uh, and that, um, as you can imagine, there's kind of a run on air purifiers nationally now. And so what we can get in time, what's cost effective, what's not too loud for students, right? They still need to be in the classroom learning. And I think I found a brand that's gonna work, uh, but it's upwards of you know over $70,000 to put air purifiers that are HEPA, air purifiers, so they're purifying down to 99.97% uh, to then they can take out the micron, uh, get down to the micron level that'll take out the particles associated with the virus um, and or the droplets associated with the virus. Uh, that's, not, that's not the only way that we're exchange air, those are supplemental. Uh, so what you have, right, is we'll also have window fans. With these buildings, right, we're gonna encourage uh, keeping the windows open and exchanging, bringing in outside air to the extent as possible. That's one of the, the key mantras that you see in all guidance is maximize uh, outside air uh, that is exchanging with internal air as, as often as possible. So we'll, we'll bring in window fans. Uh, of course, with New England, we'll just use those up until everybody can tolerate. Um, and then there's testing and reviewing of the existing HVAC equipment, right? So right now we have folks in there cleaning both uh, Hopkins and Hadley Elementary as you can imagine, Hopkins has uh, mostly a dated system back from the 50s and 60s. Uh, and I think a simple cleaning of some of the, those uh, univents, is gonna go a long way. A lot of the fans uh, that do bring in the outside air from those univents are quite clogged. So that's going on now, and that's gonna help it bring in that outside air uh, in that exchange rate. There might be some repair that's needed. We don't know yet until they, they just started that work. Uh, so that's why that that's the largest ticket item there, that HVAC inspection and repair. It's really the repair that's going to probably be the ticket. And we've asked for earmarking up to 100000 because we don't really know what it's going to be until they get in there. We know the cleaning is going to obviously be cheaper than that. But that's going to be a big, the key way that we do air exchange within our, our rooms. So all told, that adds up to about $223,150 of CARES Act fund. And I will say thank you to David Nixon and Chief Spanknable for 
helping us think through this initial draft and, and really assessing what we think is required. So a quick question on the unit events. Um, I know that was a either capital item or a town meeting item at one right. point. Uh, have those, did we pass that? I don't remember whether or not that was No, passed. it didn't pass. And that was to replace them, David. And um, which I think is, is due, right? As I said, most of them are from the 50s and 60s. Some of them getting the parts is gonna be a little bit of an issue, uh, but you know that's what we have now. And, and to be honest, the, you know, the old systems maybe aren't that bad, right? Because they are tied directly to the exterior walls and they're pulling in outside air, mixing it with internal air. So we'll open up those dampers to maximize the amount of outside air comes in. We'll clean those fans to increase the suction. We're gonna replace the filters. So the filters are rated by what's called the MERV rating. And so that's it's usually the guidance now is you go up to a MERV 13, um, to which will make sure that that filter captures the virus. We're only gonna go up to 11. And the reason being is because you, you have a finer mesh filter, the draw is reduced, right? So there's a balance there. And so we'll go up to 11, it'll capture some, and we'll have, but, but we'll be able to maximize external air internally, and that's become a priority. What's also included here is that the HVAC company is gonna go on the roof and clean up the vents up there to make sure that the draw uh, in the building is, is, uh, is efficient. Who did, who did you have for HVAC coming in, Paul? I believe it's TJ Conway, is that right? Yeah, Annie? that's correct. And okay. also, if I could also to David Phil's uh, question, so Paul captured that entirely, but just uh, as a reminder, we did submit a Mass School Building Authority request mm -hmm. for funding around replacing that capital item. And David Phil, that could be kind of what's floating around your memory right now. So that is out there. We would not hear. Last time we submitted it, it was denied. We resubmitted it. We would not hear until, assuming things plug along, we would not hear until December. My guess is that projects like this are all of a sudden going to, going to surface as priorities across the Commonwealth. However, even with that, it's a, it's a fairly long process. For any of you, Joyce would remember, I think she might've been on the school committee then. Um, when you do building projects with MSBA, it's not immediate. They don't say, we approve, you get money. You have to have a study group, you have to. So even if we're approved, you're still talking the HVAC system is not attended to, and you have to vote it on town meeting floor because they don't pay for 100%, right? So there are no guarantees with that. Yeah, I do remember that, Ian. I have a couple of questions. Um, is on all this stuff, PPE, air purifiers, I mean, it, the lead times on that stuff, do you even have any idea if you could get them before the school year starts? Because I know, for my business, just trying to find like air filters for a respirator. That's kind of like a random item, but they're all back ordered. So I don't know if you guys have looked into that. And I have a too. Yeah, I have. I've been on the phone to several. I've been getting just different quotes and it's a little bit all over the board. Um, one I spoke to today, um, they didn't fully commit, but they thought they could make that, especially now that we were potentially going to bump to uh, mid September start. So I do think six weeks, we, if, we, if, if you all approve this now, tomorrow I'll be working on this and uh, to get these ordered as soon as possible. I'd like, I'd like to share. Also, sorry, uh, and just with that, May Joyce, that uh, the other advantage that we have, Christian, is that if we run into problems with back ordering, Operational Services Division has been very quick to try to assist towns and uh, school departments if you run into problems with with back orders. So um, they recognize that the bottom line is if the HVAC system isn't uh, at a place where it needs to be, in-person learning is off the table. Um, and that's true across the Commonwealth. Right. I, I just like to share with you that um, this past week, Partners, which is Mass General Brigham has put into effect that um, in our office and at the hospital that you have to wear a shield over your mask, um, what they're saying is that I, eyes need to be protected also. So I just want to throw that out there that there that's something else that we might want to think about besides having face masks. We're also going to have to have eye shields over the face masks, um, especially if you're going to be in contact with anybody for over 10 minutes. So this has been a new ruling this week. We're scrambling ourselves uh, to get face masks in the office, you know, the clear things 
which go over your eyes and your um, glasses and your uh, face mask also. So just something else for, for us to think about that that's another thing that we probably will need if you're going to be in close contact uh, with students or anything else that you will need a face shield also. Mr. Chair, yes, sir. Um, just be advised. So emergency management has been working closely with Annie. Um, I, I've uh, spoken with her multiple times. We've actually been in discussions with, uh, we have a good, pretty good cash right now, both regionally and locally of PPE. And we supported them with some of their summer learning program. Um, so we have, uh, we have sufficient supplies right now um, in order to support this. So even if there is a back order, we're working on getting the best possible pricing through our contacts, through state, you know, state bid, and then also through who we normally purchase for our EMS side of the house. So we are working closely on the PPE side. Uh, so I am currently, I do not have a concern about the PPE. Do you, do you have the face shields, Mike? We do. We actually had a pretty su substantial donation oh, uh, good. from Smith & Wesson. And Good. also we have, we just received an additional cash from mass emergency management um, that can be okay. used for, you know, for this type of a, a program because I would consider our teaching staff and just as Annie and I have discussed, I consider the schools an essential function for our yep. community. So I think we're good right now. Okay. Um, I just, I, that was a new ruling for me this week. So I just, I wanted to share that with you tonight too. Mike, didn't Mil Milton Bradley uh, donate some to, to the police or fire? I apologize. Yes, John. Thank you for the correction. It was Milton Bradley. My apologies. Uh, my question for David Nixon and Chief Spanknable is uh, if we earmark this money, is this going to put us in a tight spot with any other plans that we're using the money for, or do we have the funds available? So we have an authorization of up to $471,000. If we granted the school the $223,000, um, that would leave a, a, a kitty of $258,000. Uh, right now, uh, I can't see, and Chief, uh, correct me if I'm right, I can't see us spending that kind of money, even if the uh, the federal government use the um, money to cover a shortfall in 2020. Yeah, I believe, and Annie can chime in on this, I believe the, so the priority here is the HVAC and this air handling equipment. So we are attempting to support on, you know, uh, Annie can answer to this, but um, I think whatever we need to do in an effort and the priority is the HVAC and air exchanges, uh, we're working diligently on all the other, so the tents, the PPE, the desks, and um, again, I think this is an appropriate use of the CARES Act funds. We can request through FEMA still, uh, so we may be able to get that 75% back on some of this as a first stab, and then, um, and then the CARES Act can maybe fill in on some of it. I, I, I'd like to make a motion right now that we totally support this uh, HVAC and everything getting done for the schools so that we make that safe for the kids I, and the teachers and all of our personnel. Um, I think this has a very much priority in our life right now. So I'm going to make a motion that we support uh, cash-wise of what we need to do. From the CARES Act. Yeah, From the CARES Act, yes. Oh. So can I get a second, please? If there's any other grandma, John, second. thank you, Christian. Other, <laughs> yeah. And is there any other grant money available? Uh, are you seeing yeah. anything on the road from the state? Yeah, so that's a great question, John. All of us are kind of sitting on the edge of our seats to see what comes out of Congress, right? Yeah. And there yeah. has been talk that there may be something what we call similar to recovery monies that we saw for schools in 2009. And okay. we would, so a couple of things that are important as you're voting on this to know is we're asking only that you uh, earmark or encumber, depending on how, how you have the funds down, whichever word is most appropriate. We would provide you with invoices. We're not looking for an allocation right now. We would, you would just reimburse for actual costs. So it's, it's 
an estimate that you only reimburse for actual costs. Obviously, uh, we would not go over any of those costs without coming before the select board. And then if funding for schools came in October, that could be applied in some way to this, we would figure out how we could reorganize our operating budget to then turn comparable monies back to the town, right? So if something became available that addresses, the problem we have now is that, to Christian's point, to Paul's point, we need to get the air purifiers ordered yesterday. Yeah. And um, for the benefit of the town, just so people understand, I so appreciate the support for our families, our students and our teachers, but this is actually about the entire community's health. Like, yeah. so the big question that people have is, when you reopen school buildings, what will happen to community transmission rates? And what we feel very strongly about is we want to say to the community, we will do everything that we can to reduce the risk associated with opening these school buildings. Because the last thing we want to see is a spike in community transmission. And if, if we can't reduce risk and effectively open schools, in a reduced risk capacity for in-person learning, it has tremendous economic consequences for the town as well. Yeah. So this is about the entire town, and I deeply appreciate how much the town cares for its faculty, staff, and families as well. Absolutely. And I'm sorry. I just, I, I, I'm having a hard time with this just because I really appreciate all this that you guys are going through. I think it's a really, really hard decision. I see Annie's point. Um, and I've struggled with this in my own mind and debates with my wife and friends and all kinds of things about what is going to protect our kids in our schools. I, I feel like this is a great attempt. I don't know if all these items are what's going to protect our children in the schools. And that's my own opinion. I'm a fan of remote schooling a little bit, and I'm just going to state my bias. So I'm kind of on the fence about this because I see your point and I want to support the schools and I want our kids going back safely but it's a really hard decision to make for you guys. And my only question and pertaining to this is from a remote school perspective, why don't we have any kind of technology or anything along those lines in this list where that would support an alternative to returning to school? So we could certainly uh, evaluate. We have made a tremendous investment in uh, technology we used uh, a lot of school choice money. If you recall, we originally were going to go for a capital request. We withdrew that. We invested school choice money to enhance and improve our capacity to provide remote learning, to make sure each child had his or her own device so that they weren't sharing items. So we have made an investment. We also applied for a technology grant to the state. I haven't heard yet on that. We'll continue to make investments in technology. At some point in time, I'm assuming, ultimately these decisions will be made by the school committee, but even if uh, health metrics were to indicate that um, it didn't make sense to have in-person learning at the start of the school year in the fall, at some point children have to return. And even if people are ultimately saying that, well, we'll it, but when it'll be better when there's a vaccine, I believe the floor on the vaccine uh, effectiveness rate is it has to be 50% effective. So we still would be, we still, I believe, would be remiss if we weren't investing in all of the mitigation strategies that we possibly could to make sure that in-person learning, that we've reduced risk as much as possible for in-person learning. Like, I don't think an, under, under any scenario, we absolve ourselves of that responsibility. And we are making those um, other investments that uh, you so, so wisely are pointing at. Um, that should be made in terms of, of technology. It's also important to note that with there could be some additional, the commissioner has indicated that if districts um, do not offer in-person learning, right? if they refuse to offer in-person learning, um, and there isn't a, uh, there aren't public health metrics to support that decision. So DPH sent me the most recent uh, two-week countywide transmission rate at 1.5%. So the public health metrics were not there to support a, a decision to not go to in-person, to not have an in-person option. Any family can choose remote, but to not have an in-person option, that we could see things like um, students in those districts would not be allowed to participate in any form of athletics. Um, some people might be saying, what athletics would be safe at all? 
could be that golf is safe in the fall, but there could be implications for athletics. There could also be implications for some funding. Um, and so it doesn't mean at the end of the day, I know that our school committee will make whatever decision is logical in the best interest of constituents and takes into consideration data. But those are also, also uh, pieces that I think people should be aware of. I just like to chime in on that a little bit. I, I understand that parents have a difficult decision on whether or not they want to send their children back to school. But in talking to a lot of uh, people that I work with and having children, they really feel that at some point that their children need to get back to school, however small amount it might be for that socialization to make sure that their friends are okay that they want to have contact with their teachers. They want to feel uh, that school is a part of their every day, not just doing it from home. Um, I am, and I don't have kids in school, but if I did, I would feel that even going part-time two to three, you know how there's some communities are doing two days at school and three days virtual or one day off to do the cleaning and things like that, however they might do it. But I think kids today still need to know that they have other friends. You can't isolate people. It's not what people um, do, do well. And, um, and whether it be learning or not, some kids can't learn at home. Some people uh, are not able to teach their children at home or be able to do that with them virtually online. And they need to get back into the classroom to have that learning experience and, and getting to know what they need to do. So I'm in favor of, of doing some sort of um, having people get back into the children, get back into school and having some normalcy uh, to all the things that we're having to have to put up with this COVID. I think it's important for them. And Christian, I'll just chime in just quickly. We did a survey of, of parents and you might've taken it about whether you're intending to send your child back, leaning to send it, your child back or children leaning towards remote or definite remote. And 69% said they're either definitely going to send their child back or leaning towards sending their child back. 42 said definitely and 17 said leaning towards. And that was before they really, we, uh, that was two weeks ago. We just did a new survey that I'll process tonight. So we have a large contingency that wants to send their child back. And so as Annie said, I think this would be, we're, we're trying to do everything we can that's within reasonableness to mitigate the risk. And as a select board person, I want to help you do that. Thank you, I want I want to get things going. I'm in support of giving you whatever money you need <laughs> to get this up and running and get your get your HVAC systems to whatever you need, Paul. So you got my support. Thanks, right. Jeff. Uh, appreciate uh, this. A second on the table. Any last further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Air purifiers for all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. More, thank more you, more Annie. Time, it wisely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all you, right. Paul. Thank you. Thanks, folks. And thank you, uh, Fire Public Safety, for helping us with summer school. Thank you guys so much. And thank you, School Department, for all the work you are putting in on these different plans you have to provide. I, I watched that as your liaison, and it's amazing. Yeah. If you need me to plan anything, you got a party coming up, like a kid's mm -hmm. birthday, I'll write a hundred page plan for you, free of charge. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can't plan any trips, so you got to uh, plan school. Uh, right. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All right. So um, 6.3 star removal proposal, we're going to pass over that this evening. Um, I do want to jump down to the a uh, resolution regarding the Hoyoke Soldiers Home. I believe Stephen Connor is here to speak to that. Uh, if he can unmute himself or maybe Jennifer can. I am on and I just passed Hadley Town Hall, so I'm pulling in at the Central Rock Gym. All right. So I can talk with you. Okay. Hold on one sec. <laughs> hey, Steve, welcome. Thanks. I was I was trying to stay at home, but I in a, had a family commitment, and I I then had to get in the car and go. But that's um, okay. Okay. 
Okay. So am I still all right? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, I wish to um, speak about the resolution. Um, I am a member of the committee to um, the coalition for the Hoyoke Soldiers Home. We at first um, gathered uh, over a month and a half ago. And what people wanted to do was to figure out how to uh, build a monument to the 76 veterans that died. Uh, those people who know the veteran world, monuments are important. Uh, recognition is important. But as they started to meet about it and discuss it, they thought the best thing that they could do was build a monument by building the new wing on the soldier's home. That would be the best thing they could do to recognize those 76 veterans who died. Um, in case people wanted to know, there was at least one, I believe, two veterans from Hadley who had passed. Um, over there and that had come in from heavy and it, it makes a lot of sense if you read the resolution it's basically asking the state to look at Hoyoke soldiers home the same way they're looking at Chelsea I won't go through all the details because I can go on for hours about it but there were things that were cited in Chelsea and the state stepped up and they addressed them but before that there were a lot of needs in Hoyoke that we brought up and they were talked about and they never got addressed. Time after time after time, we tried to get it done. Um, in 2017, I wrote to our representative, uh, Peter Cocott. I did a detailed memo about what the issues were. Um, it turns out that I probably should have gotten an A on that because I was pretty spot on in what the issues were. It, it was a tragedy what happened. Our veterans that have already sacrificed a lot shouldn't be sacrificing again at the end of their life. And that's what they ended up doing. I don't think anybody wants to really hear the horror stories that I've heard from family members and from nurses and stuff. It was pretty ugly. The resolution is basically asking the cities and towns out here in Western Massachusetts to support the coalition's work to, I, I'm not sure if I want to use such a strong word, but I think maybe I will demand that the state treat us equally and get us that wing of 125 extra beds so that we are able to provide a dignified and honorable existence for these gentlemen and the women before they pass end of life. They don't, they don't need to be like crammed in rooms, have to go down a hallway, five, six doors down just to be able to take a shower. It, we're asking that every room have a shower and a bath. Some of the rooms are still going to be two to a person, but many of them are going to be single individual rooms and they're going to be so that they can control any infectious disease, but more importantly, really give what the state always says that we give them, which is honor and dignity. And I'm sorry, but the way these gentlemen and women were treated up until the pandemic hit and then what happened after, they were not treated with honor and dignity. And, and our resolution is asking you as a town to support our work to make sure that not only does this never happen again, but we do the steps that need to be done so that there's compatibility between the soldiers home in Chelsea and the soldiers home in Hoyo. My, uh, my Jaji spent the last uh, couple of years of his life there. Uh, he passed about six years ago, but yeah, there's definitely room for improvement there. So uh, I think it's great that you guys are doing this. I'll make a motion yeah. to that effect that we sign the resolution. I am all in favor of it. I'm tired of us out here on the opposite side of 495 not getting the uh same benefits as the other side of 495 and i think that they ought to step up and take care of our veterans out here as much as they do on the other side so my vote is yes can i yeah, just yeah. Say, can i just say one thing um my my dad actually was there uh passed away last year i don't think he would have made it I really don't. Yeah. yeah. 
So I'm just, I'm yes, sorry. It's, a good thing. it's a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. We need to do this. Absolutely. And the soldiers home is great. They're so great. They really are. The, they really the staff is always, yeah. they always, the staff is to, always, go yeah. ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, they, uh, Steve, they always tried to do the best they can. Yes. I never heard anything negative from a lot of people that had their families yeah. down there, but I think we can do better. Yeah. And I, I think that's what this is all about. It's not that a lot of our parents, our loved ones, our uncles or whatever, didn't get the proper care down there. The love that they had, the staff down there is great, but they, it can be better. And that's what we're asking for is for them to have better care. Yeah, what I would add is, is um, and as you know, my brother passed away there uh, mm -hmm. back nine, eight years ago. Yeah. Um, and they they did give him great care, but there were certain things they couldn't control. And I've been watching since mm -hmm. then the morale of that institution going way down. Mm -hmm. the, the staff have felt overworked, beaten down, not yeah. respected. And so with that comes some lack of care. And, and because yeah. there were so few of them, all of the issues. The other side of it is, is that we are entering a point where the Vietnam veterans are the next in line to really utilize that. They're going to need it. And yep. we've already not done the best service to them to begin with. This yep. is a chance to make up for that. Um, and and as, as is, I already have two requests last week for veterans who want to go in there. Yep. There's something about the camaraderie. There's something about wanting to be with their mates at end of life. I don't necessarily always understand it, but yep. I witness it. I know it. And yep. if I'm going to send anybody else in there and I'm helping them do the paperwork, I want to make sure that I'm sending them to a place that's safe because I felt so guilty after that whole episode. So, You know what, Stephen? I'm going to say this. I might embarrass you, but your parents would be so proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> knowing, knowing your mom, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I truly believe that they'd be so proud of you as the advocate for veterans. So thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Right. <laughs> you succeeded in embarrassing me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good guy. <laughs> All those in favor. Aye. 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 All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you all very, very much. Yep. Keep Bye -bye. plugging along. Thank I you, will. Stephen. Thank you. Uh, we got that document, David. We're going to need to come in and sign that. Or? I'm uh, actually going to come and do a road trip tomorrow to get your signatures on a, a notarization that we need to do later. Okay. So you'll all be seeing me tomorrow. It's road trip time in Hadley. You Fabulous. may have to hit me. You may have to hit me first because I'm leaving town about one. Understood. Thank you. All right. So uh, real quick, we need to circle back. Uh, Jane alerted me that I skipped the senior center reopening discussion. So, um, David, do you have any input on that? And uh, I think Haley was here. I'm not sure if she still is, but uh, or, or Jane, I'm sure you can speak to it. So. There's Haley, right there. <laughs> well, I'm happy to start. Um, I didn't jump in quick enough when you were talking about the reopening of Town Hall. Um, so I would like to propose that the Senior Center um, scale up its public offerings in a very modest, um, easy going, slow way um, to, pu to small groups um, inside of the new Senior Center building. Um, and the activities and services permitted would be consistent with phase three um, allowed services proposed by the governor. Um, what we'd like to be able to do is permit um, like 10 or fewer people in exercise classes, um, adult indoor classes of other types like arts and crafts, for example, and non-emergency home visits, um, which, are, which are different than um, offerings within the center, but I would like to permit our outreach worker to visit um, clients in their homes um, on occasion. Um, so that's really it. I just want to put that before you because it seems like it's time to gradually 
um, give the public access to this amazing resource, which is huge and has great air circulation and I think can um, accommodate this with minimum risk. Are we doing any type of uh, open house uh, uh, grand opening or uh, anything of that nature before we start any of these classes, Haley? Uh, has That's any not what I... No, no because we, we can't have the big party. We were planning a four-day blast. Oh, my God, Jane. Four days. Holy moly. Well, <laughs> that was so everybody would have an opportunity to be available when they wanted to. But that's a large crowd. We're talking about small people. And the thing Haley didn't say was only by signing up first. We will have absolute control of how many people are going to be in the building. Yep. And speaking like Paul Pfeiffer did for the uh, schools, I can talk all about the heating and air conditioning system, which is brand new. And we don't have to have all the ductwork cleaned. And we don't have to have all the filters cleaned, although we do that all the time. Um, and we have a 30% mix of fresh air coming in to the system at all times. We're moving 3,000 cubic, 3, cubic feet a minute through the building. And we do have windows that open should we need to. I don't have a problem with you doing classes and keeping track of what how many people you have and following the guidelines. I don't have a problem with that at all. I think it's great. Time to get life back as much as normally as we can. So yeah. And for seniors, for seniors, that's very important because socialization, as Joyce said, for the school kids is really important for the elders too. Absolutely, Jane. Absolutely. I'll make a motion to open the senior center to limited classes and have you take care of, uh, Haley, take care of how many people they have assigned and registered for those classes and proceed. And uh, non-emergency. All second. Can we add non-emergency home visits to that? Correct. Okay. All right. And can, can we just add to that too, maybe that we just stay in line with the phases so that if we go back to phase two or something, it gets kind of rolled back without coming to the select board, just to say we're in those different phases. As if we'll, we'll continue the guidelines as we need to. Does that, does that serve that, Christian? Yes, that's fine. Yeah, as long as we stay within the state guidelines. Correct. Can someone re-second that just so it's clean? I'll re-second that. <laughs> All right. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Sue had something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make sure, um, I'm pretty sure at the Senior Center they have a sign-in sheet so that there is a contact um, log so that if anybody does end up with COVID, that there's a way back for the health department to contact other people. Yeah. Yes, actually, our Contact. My Senior Center system that works, that all the seniors use to sign in and we keep our numbers so we can report them to the town, has a COVID tracing system on it now. So it can say who was there and who was in the same class and give us the whole thing. That's very cool. We need to set something up like that for town hall. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Moving Thank on. you. Thank you, Haley. Appreciate it. Uh, next, we have accounting services and audit services. The regional accounting services contract with Eric Kinscherf, CPA, through the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission was not renewed for FY21. The town administrator and town treasurer recommend hiring Melanson company to perform accounting because Mellinson company formerly performed the town of Hadley annual audit. Another auditor is required to maintain the integrity of the town's reporting of finances. The town administrator, the town treasurer, recommend hiring uh, Powers and Sullivan to perform the FY20 audit. Power and Sullivan are the town's former auditors from 2005. So I'm sure Linda has Lots to say about this, and David Nixon as well.
Linda, you're muted. Right. We had two laptops on, so we were getting some feedback. So, so I think that's better. Yeah. So, um, David and I, we've been working on this together. David, why don't you get started? Okay. So we, um, we, we, uh, we lost our accounting firm. We, uh, have, uh, we understand that Melanson, formerly Melanson and Heath, uh, gotten into the accounting and they're performing the accounting in Hatfield. Uh, talking to the town administrator over in Hatfield, they're very happy with the uh, treatment that they're getting from Melanson. I talked to Melanson Company and they are willing to uh, be our auditors. Uh, they have suggested a price which is very affordable um, because they uh, would not, did I just say auditor? I meant accountant. Um, and uh, so they would have to stand away from being the auditor. I talked to Sullivan. Uh, they're willing to uh, be our auditors and their price is within our budget. Uh, we've worked with Powers and Sullivan in the past. Uh, they do good work. Um, so my recommendation is um, to authorize Linda and me to sign the documents that are necessary in order to perform the accounting for FY, the wrap up for 20 and the accounting for FY21 and for Powers and Sullivan to perform the FY2020 audit. So wonder. I'm new to this game, and as I read these contracts, uh, there are no prices on them, and I'm just curious if that's something that will be public knowledge later or not. Yes, that it will be public knowledge when we have the final prices there. Um, Thank you. Uh, I have verbal quotes um, and that are tell me that we're going to be well within our budget. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Did second. I make the motion? I don't know. Yeah, you made the motion. <laughs> I'll second. <laughs> it can get funnier as we go on here. <laughs> just, just have a question on this: Is who who's going to be in the um, in town hall representing the accounting firm? Are we going to have someone in town hall? We're going to have Mary Erickson. Uh, who's going to remain and do uh, the uh, work uh, of processing the invoices. Uh, and as soon as, uh, as she is able to get back into town hall, uh, she'll be there on a regular basis. How many hours? For Mary? Yeah. I think we've got her budgeted for 20, don't we? uh we what we have is a total um 20 10 to 20 a week it depends as you saw from your uh the very first item on your agenda tonight uh, the last few weeks there have been a lot of uh invoice uh, a lot of warrants processing because we're finishing up 20 and we're starting 21. in a normal week uh or in, uh, let me say in the best week we're processing one for the town and one for the school uh plus payroll every other week um, sometimes we have to have a, a third warrant in for various purposes, but this has been a very vi busy stretch the last few uh, weeks. Um, we are glad to have Mary be able to continue with warrant processing as long as that works with Melanson, uh, with Melanson Heath. Um, uh, and, and they're very agreeable to that and they have that same kind of arrangement with other towns. So we're excited about how this is going to begin. Uh, one issue we have with a remote accountant is that they don't routinely spend time at town hall. And that is the arrangement that we have with Mary, except for the COVID situation. So once we get back into others being able to town, come to town hall, that would be the plan that she comes in once a month and deal once a week and deals with that. In the meantime, the way we've been carrying on is I basically empty the accountant's box and send her everything that she needs by scan and email. And fortunately, most of the department heads also have been taking care of doing their scanning and emailing their invoices to her. So the warrant processing has been continuing along, but the other accounting business, hopefully that uh, Melanson will be able to step in and finish up 20 for us 
and hopefully keep us on schedule for our planned uh, November borrowing um, and, um, and take care of 21. And then we'll deal with whatever the next step is next. But this is probably, I think that David and I both felt this was the best next step to take given where we were and uh, given the situation that we have in town hall now of not really being able to hire a person to come in and not knowing uh, when we could dedicate office space to anybody that this was, um, Lanson knows us very well and um, they've been doing our auditing for several years and we think this will be a fairly smooth transition under the circumstances. Okay, any further discussion? Yeah, we went for a full time um, to part time, part time, part you know, time and we've had nothing but trouble with these part times. We have had trouble. <laughs> what can we say? Um, uh, what I'm trying to say is maybe it's time just to think about hiring somebody 20, 25 hours for the town, and, and I know you're limited on space right now. Mm -hmm. In the long run, I think we may be ahead, ahead of the game. Um, I don't think personally this is the time for that, given that we don't have a place to put a new person. Um, I think that we're really limited by what we can do in town hall right now. I'm not even working in town hall right now. I'm working remotely. Uh, Mary, who's supposed to be there once a week, is sp still working remotely. Um, I think we're doing the best we can under the circumstances. To start a new person as an employee under the circumstances doesn't seem like the right way to go, John. Um, given that, I don't think there's any basic philosophical objection to that as a way to go. It just doesn't seem the way to go right now. And I think because we did have this as an option, and we didn't have this a year ago because Melanson only recently got into the accounting side of things because they were mostly auditors before. I think this is the best next step. I think that what you're what you're suggesting is something that we should continue dis to discuss. But right now, I think this is the way to go. Yeah, this this is a good interim solution since we were kind of left without somebody. So um, we can, John, we can look at that. Uh, mm -hmm later in the year for, for next year, for sure. No, exactly. I, I just want to keep bringing it up because I want to keep it in the back of your minds because yep. in my view, we have not made good decisions with accountants since the full-time one left. Okay. It's a, it's a difficult field because there are fewer people going into municipal accounting, specifically Massachusetts municipal accounting. It's a very, very tiny, tiny field. Um, so, um, We'll keep our options open going forward. Um, it's not a bad suggestion, and I think that we should discuss it again in the future. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Christian, was that a yes? That was a yes, yes. <laughs> I figured the wave was a yes, all right. <laughs> Thank you, that, that makes things a lot easier right now and keeps us on track. All right, so moving on, we'll drop down to 6.6, uh, Route 9 widening project, town property, and land taking. Do we have anybody here from MassDOT? Doesn't look like it. Why would they show up? <laughs> yeah, I've been hearing all kinds of complaints about the land taking from one end of the job to the other. So... Yeah. They are, I'll just read what the agenda item is. Uh, MassDOT requests the town allow MassDOT to take town owned land sidewalk and and create temporary easements in order to make room for an ADA compliant sidewalk as part of the Route 9 widening project. The affected town owned properties are the northeast corner of Middle Street and Route 9 and a strip of sidewalk in the vicinity of the American Legion and Coach property. So I really don't wanna discuss this at this point because we invited them to show up tonight. Um, my viewpoint is that until we, ha they have not made good on any of their promises with us to take care of the sidewalks, take care of snow removal, on and yep. on. They promised yep. this on camera, off camera, everywhere else, yet they never followed. They owe us one more 
uh, community meeting also. I don't know how we're going to do it or if we can do it, but they do owe us that before this project gets into 100%. Right. And so I, I don't want to grant any of these requests until they can actually show up at a meeting and explain themselves and actually commit to taking care of the sidewalks. Um, Amy Fiden uh, informed me that the project, one of the project managers told her that basically all the sidewalks were going to be either the town's or the business's responsibility that they're installing on Route 9. So, yeah, no. I mean, nah. That, that's Not happening. Yeah, that's a huge issue. So I, Amy can probably go into some more detail, but I don't, I don't see a reason to grant this request until we have something from them. And where are we at with the sewer and water, the underground work uh, of this project? We're meeting tomorrow in order to talk about the uh, positioning the town uh, for the SRF uh, program, the state revolving fund program. Uh, we have a design for the... Uh, with sewer and water, we have some ideas about the prices. So, uh, next step is to, to be to begin the financial work, and uh, then we need to have a stakeholders meeting. Who are you meeting with tomorrow, David? We're meeting with GPI, which is the engineer. Their engineers. Uh, sorry. Their engineers. Yeah. Um, just one thing is, yeah, the guy that promised us that route not, or DOT was going to take care of the sidewalks, he's not on the project anymore. So um, we'll see what happens there. And the second thing, too, is if this is the library right now, the library trustees are in charge of that building. So in this this language, it was referring to the library trustees about the land in front of the library, not the select board. So I don't know if the library trustees would actually have to vote on it, not the select board. Actually, <laughs> actually, Christian, Christian, that is a town building. It's not a library trustee. That is a town building. Yeah, so mass DOT would have to change the language because it says library trustees right now. Correct. It is is it's the town building, not the library trustees building. So I'd I'd like to allow Amy just a couple of minutes just to kind of give you some more information to I'm sure fire you up about what's going on with it. So Amy I've got Amy Fide Amy Fiden? Yes. I see okay. her. So Amy, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, I, I seen her out on a lawn in front of the bank for about two hours. Or so I'm sure they must have had a lot to say. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I did. I spent a lot of time. We had one, the first gentleman came in from Mass DOT. He came around to all the businesses and just was looking to provide a map, say it wasn't a big deal, ask us to sign off on something, saying he gave us the map. Uh, I wasn't i looked at the map but i wasn't understanding what the map said because it had a lot of um like words like r and r i didn't know what that meant a lot of terms on the map that a normal person r uh, amy r and r is rest and recuperation <laughs> that's what we thought but i guess <laughs> oh it's remove and replace yep. yeah that's a different one <laughs> So this gentleman came down uh, and he's from Mass DOT. He was, he gave us some information, uh, but then when I questioned him a little bit more, and this was especially regarding um, East Street. Uh, on East Street, right now going um, between, um, on the bank side on East Street, they are putting in another, another lane and um, a bike um, uh, lane. So now it'll be a five lane on E Street going north. It's currently three lanes now. The, on the other side of uh, E Street from the police station, it's currently two lanes and it's going to go into three. That somewhat makes sense because that is, uh, that, because, that would make sense because sometimes I get backed up there, plus you have public safety coming out of there. I can understand that. The other side didn't make a lot of sense. I don't see a lot of backup there. I mean, maybe later the chiefs uh, uh, pipe in and they could tell me that, that that it does make sense to have more lanes. But at this point, I didn't see a need to have five lanes 
So when I questioned the first gentleman, he said, oh, no, they changed that project. It wasn't going to be five lanes. But he was unsure. Then I had more people come from Boston because he couldn't really give me exact information. And I said, well, I want to make sure I understand the project completely. So the people came in from Boston and they are the um, from GPI and the designers and they came in. Come to find out they are doing five lanes. They are putting sidewalks in down East Street on both sides. Um, it's gonna, the East Street, one side is gonna be by the bank and just go in front of our neighbor's house behind the bank. And the other side is gonna be just in front of the post office and go down only past Leon's. I asked, why would you not put the sidewalk all the way down to either the bike trail well, or East Street Commons? but they didn't want to go that far. They said that's, that's not, so they only go part way. It's up to the town to finish it up. Uh. So I didn't think that was a good answer, but anyways, I, uh, I, when I talked to the, the people from Boston, they said it's definitely five lanes. And so they have conflicting information. The other thing is they said to me, well, it's not a big deal to you because we're not really taking much of your land. And so it's not, it shouldn't show. Well, what happens is it's not our land it's the town's land. On East Street, the town owns some of that land because that's where the poles are and things like that. I said, well, visually, it looks like our, even though we're not, we might not get paid for it, but you're, you're visually taking the, the town's land, which we mow, which looks like ours. We take care of it as ours and customers don't know that. And you're taking a lot of that land. And you're putting in a sidewalk, which not quite sure why um, and who's going to be responsible for it. I asked those questions. And then when I spoke to the neighbor next to us, he didn't know anything about the sidewalk that's going in front of his property. Probably, and he was told, he was told, all he was told is it's just an inconvenience. We're not really going to take on any of your, much of your land. You're just getting paid for an inconvenience. He's never told about a sidewalk in front of his property. The thing is, I think they're being sneaky. They're telling the businesses down here that it's not your land. Even though we might feel like it is, even it might be state land or town or town land, state or town, but these the businesses right now take care of it. Um, if they put a sidewalk in our neighbors, right in front of our neighbors, is he gonna have room to pull in his car all the way? Um, I just think they're being, uh, not truthful and, and not transparent with the whole um, proposal. So I have a big problem with that. I asked them, uh, they, they were not, we had a problem with the sign. We wanted to know where we can move our sign. And when we were told by one guy, the first guy he says, oh, we'll take care of that for you. We'll pay for it. Well, the next group said, oh no, we remove it. We give you some money, but that's your problem. You got to take care of your own sign. So. This was, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of um, um, East Hampton Savings Bank and having the, all these issues, but I'm, I just um, found out and they're going up and down the street. So I, I bet you a lot of our businesses are gonna end up with some of the same issues and they're not being forthcoming to it. They're trying to be sneaky around it. And I come to find out, I asked a lot of questions and this feedback right now, um, he says, we're just waiting for feedback and we haven't had any feedback from the town. I said, well, who did you send everything to? And I guess they just sent our stuff to um, the uh, DPW uh, director and that's it. They didn't send it out to everybody. So a lot of the town doesn't know. And if we, we can only give feedback for the next few weeks, they said it's gonna be set in stone on August 20th. And then there's no changes after August 20th. So I, you know, I'm, I'm not happy with them on not giving us the, uh, ample time to discuss all this. And they said, well, you can, um, you can, what you can do is it's all during negotiations later on um, with your property. Well, they're already taking it. So there really isn't a whole lot of negotiating to do. They're gonna take the property. Um, our negotiation is you're gonna put a bus stop in front of our property and people are walking into our drive up lanes and that's a liability for us. So we want them to put plantings in or something. And so that they're not walking right into our drive up. The other thing is, our, you know, this is a the bus stops they're putting in front of the bank and maybe down towards, you know, I'm not sure which one's town towards town hall. This is a historic district. Are you gonna make it look historic? 
And I, and my, my, my answer was no, they're not going to look historic. So um, I, I think there's some issues and I don't think that all the businesses have the correct information. I think that I said, we were not notified whatsoever until recently of what the process was. I said, the only reason why we knew anything was because of um, last year, I went to a um, something that was held by the Chamber of Commerce. They, they presented something, um, which they had mass D B DOT come in, but it was something that got out through the Chamber of Commerce. So my thinking was, is a lot of these businesses don't participate with the Chamber of Commerce. So I, uh, and, and the, as far as the, um, every time I asked them about who's going to maintain it, I would like something in writing. He wouldn't give me anything. He said, it's, you know, it's really between the town. And I gave him the article. There was an article in the Gazette that says the state vows to, um, the state vows to clear snow and ice on all new sidewalks. Um, in the article, it does state that they could not get, um, could not confirm this with mass dot okay but film that. this to boston i said it's already in the article that you're going to do it but i want to see it confirmed i think it was a first uh, community meeting they had where that gentleman promised he was going to maintain those sidewalks <laughs> probably do have it on film because i think we did film that meeting uh at hopkins cafeteria at that time david did you receive those plans because they've been sitting on the desk down at the DPW for four months now. I don't know who's looked at them or who's reviewed them. I did take a morning and take a look at some of the sewer issues because I was asked to, but there is so much involved with that plan that we have that I don't know has, has anyone really physically looked at it. You're talking about the 75% complete plans? Yes. Yeah. So um, uh, I did see a copy of those in, at uh, DPW. I have talked to uh, the DPW director about uh, this is a project that's coming up. Specifically asked for the meeting with the engineers so that we can do the financial planning that's necessary for this project. It's gonna be starting in a few years. Uh, as to has anybody reviewed it on our side for uh, the technical aspects of the water and sewer and other issues um i can only assume that dpw has i don't believe so all right well, talk, i had talked to chris a little bit about the sleeve lining and that sleeve lining could be done now with uh, appropriation of a little bit of money if we do have it uh we do have a few other areas that that need to be addressed sooner rather than later that are deteriorating. All right, let me follow up with Chris Okafor on that. I don't believe you have the up-to-date, I, I don't believe you have the up-to-date um, information though. Uh, I was, I asked if we could get a copy of it. He said that even when he sent, it was an old copy. So my suggestion is, is I can always give you the name of the project manager, project manager, but I would suggest you get an updated copy because I was told we did not have one as far as the town is concerned. Also, it'd be great to have the planning board take a look at some of these things, especially if you're going to be in historic areas. Um, are we still in compliance with everything? I think the plan that we have on a desk on a DPW shows three lanes north side, three lanes south side at that intersection. And that's incorrect. All right. So that's something to bring up with the engineers when we meet with them tomorrow. All right. So we'll pass over this for now, and hopefully uh, we can get somebody from MassDOTA to actually show up and make good on their promises. Well, our next our next meeting is when, David? Uh, the 19th of August. So that's one day before they want us to finalize on this for August 20th. Uh, David, can we reach out and get another meeting with them? David, can we reach out and let them know that we're not signing any easement requests or anything else until somebody starts showing up and communicating? Yep. All right. All right, so moving on, special town meeting. I'm aware of all these issues because uh, myself, Chris, and David went over to 
district two for the meeting before the uh, community meeting at that time. Uh, Christian was with us too uh, at that time. And we had a lot of questions then that were unanswered. Okay, yep. let's get them answered, right? Yep. Yeah. All right, so special town meeting. Select board uh, are asked to open the warrant and set the fall town meeting. Target dates of Thursday, October 22nd or Saturday, October 24th are suggested. A draft warrant is attached. Um, so I'll is, make a motion to open the warrant. Okay. Second. All right. Any further discussion on opening the warrant? All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So then setting the date. Do we want to do? Let's see. I'll look at the calendar. Well, let's let's look for good weather uh, in case we have to have it outside. So I think if we were to do it outside, last time worked well. Um, so a Saturday would probably be better outside. Uh, Absolutely. Are those dates outside, David? Uh, I uh, outside or inside, but uh, are they on a Saturday? Yeah, the last the the twenty fourth is on a Saturday. Yeah, the twenty second of October. I would make a motion to do the twenty fourth of October outside, uh, unless uh, things change by October. Not what knowing about the week before, so you got an alternate date. Well, I know, I know, uh, John, but I think uh, not knowing what the COVID experience is going to be uh, into September with everything else going on, uh, I'd like to make provisions for us to at least do an outside one. Yeah. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. Because of the weather, maybe make two, two, two days a week before and a week after, depending on the weather. That would be fine. I thought you made a motion for the 24th. Did we make that? I'll make a motion for the 24th right now. Okay. Uh, is is there an alter alternative date for us? Okay. I'll, I'll just second the 24th. Maybe we could just schedule it now and kind of be flexible a little bit. I mean, we're just scheduling it at this point. So I well, know I last know, time we scheduled multiple days before we finally landed on a day. But so, when, we, when we're... Uh, when we're issuing the warrant, we have to have a certain date for town meeting. So I'm just trying to get us, uh, we never know what the uh, weather is going to be in, in that time frame. You know, could be good, could maybe not. How long, in advance, does, how long in advance does the date have to be set permanently? We need to give two weeks notice. Thank you. Uh, the, follow, the following Saturday from the 24th of October is Halloween. Great. That sounds good. Trick or treat. Wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a fun Christian. Oh, <laughs> decorated, I'll say. <laughs> I'll, I'll second that. So let's go for the 24th with an alternate date of the 31st. I, well, personally, if it's the 31st, I'm probably not going to be there because I'll be taking my kids trick or treating and doing other no, this is this is during the day, David, not at nighttime. All right. But you know how the town meetings can go. <laughs> I know, but I'm looking for us to, if we have to have it outside, uh, it's the 31st on a Saturday. Yes. Yeah. Wouldn't so we be better off? Doing it the 17th or the 24th because the weather's likely to be warmer. That's what I was saying. Yeah, we, we could do that too. We could do the 17th with the 24th as the alternate. David, would that work for your calendar? Uh, let me just check. Uh, it'll have to be, uh, t it'll be tight, but, you know, we'll make it work. Okay. 
So right. that was the motion, 17th, okay. alternate to the 24th. Okay, we have a second by John. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so moving on. Um, next is the capital plan. Do we, David, do we have to do anything with this tonight or can this wait until next meeting when we don't have such a long schedule? Yeah, you can defer it. Okay, so we'll defer it. Go ahead. It's gonna keep the departments moving forward on this then. Okay, yep, sounds good. So we'll skip 6.8. Uh, 6.9, town administrator transition. Uh, we're still in the works on that, so nothing really to discuss yet on that. So we'll move to old business. Um, David. Yes. What, what, what's the time frame on the administrator? Because now we're getting into the middle of August. Um, we should know something probably tomorrow, whether we'll have an agreement or not. Okay, and our next meeting is on the 19th, the 12th, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, 19th. Yeah. 19th. So then we, if we, if need be, we can always have a uh, additional meeting added in just for, to deal with that. Okay. So, all right. So uh, I would, I'd like a clarification. It was my understanding at our last meeting that, um, if negotiations for some reason should fall through, and I'm hoping they don't, um, the board directed us to contact and deal with the second place candidate. Is that correct? Correct. That's my understanding, at least. That's do true. we need to, if that happens, do we need to go before the board before we start that process? No. You no. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good enough. All right, so we'll skip down to uh, 7.4, which is diversity inclusion committee, name change, appointments, and mission statement, since we have people waiting for that, it looks like. Uh, all right, select board is asked to change the name of the former diversity and inclusion committee to the committee for diversity, equality, and inclusion. The Actually, sorry, it's diversity, equity, and inclusion, not equality. Oh, all right. Typo there. All right, committee diverse, for diversity, equity, and inclusion. The committee submits a mission statement, and the select board is asked to appoint committee member to appoint a member of the committee. Um, I don't mind appointing the committee members that they have chosen. Um, I do have a problem with part of their mission statement. So I, I would like to take that under uh, advisement tonight. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to take the whole thing under advisement. How many meetings did you have? If you're so diverse, you're already meeting. You've got how many people for this committee? I, I mean, uh, the committees, we have three or five people. What is going on over here? You've had two meetings and there are just a lot of people that are interested in this topic right now. A lot of people I think have varying degrees of interests and I think it's something that interests a lot of people in town right now. So there's a lot of people that are interested in it. Um, I'm happy to talk about whatever you guys want. If you have problems with the mission statement, then we can talk about it now or I don't know exactly how you want to uh, address any issues. I know there. Also, sorry, Christian. Yeah, I'm also a potential committee member, so I'm happy to chime in as needed. Yeah, I was going to say, I know uh, Amy here, uh, who is a, a teacher at Hopkins Academy, uh, wants to be on the committee to represent Hopkins Academy and have some crossover between our town committee and a school um, club there. Uh, we have a Hopkins Academy student that's interested in being on the committee for the town. And then my wife, Andrea, is on here, too. I don't know. We're not in the same room, so I don't know if she can hear or might be tending to the kids right now, but uh, she's on the on the committee as well. And then Wayne stopped in earlier, but uh, looks like he might have left. <laughs> I, I don't have a problem with the uh, people have, that have volunteered for the committee. I, I applaud them for stepping up to that. But I, I think that we need to take a look at uh, what the duties are, and I'd like to think about this for 
uh, another couple of weeks, Christian, if that's okay with you, um, about the first part of your mission statement was fine. Uh, what your duties might be, I think we need to discuss that as a, uh, as a select board uh, on what your duties might entail. We're looking for recommendations. We're not looking for you to um, actually uh, be uh, the solve all to some of our problems. Again, we're looking for recommendations, not for you to take over. Uh, I'm just going to throw out one thing there on um, contract negotiations or uh, doing those things. There are some things that are already in place um, that we need to talk about. So uh, that's where I'm coming from at this point. Yeah. And if I can just add too, we don't have any goals presented here right now. And that was yeah. one thing we wanted to, you know, in our last meeting, we kind of chose an organizational structure. We were trying to get all that down really figure out who's going to be the chair of this committee and then come up with some goals for the committee to present to the select board that people on the committee want to work on. Yeah. So yeah. the mission statement is very broad, but yeah. I wanted to more focus us down to what are our actual goals and then present that to the select board. But I was kind of hoping we would become a committee in order to work on our goals. I, I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with that if you want to do that and then present it in another couple of weeks. But, you know, some of these things about contract negotiations and things like that. I mean, we have uh, our contracts uh, uh, approved or things like that. I think, you know, those things we have to talk about as a select board. So and a lot um, of confidential information. Too. So, John, what did you say? A lot of that is confidential information, too. Yeah. You know, uh, and a lot of that is, is uh, some of it is uh, we have a handbook. Uh, if you want to take a look at our handbook and what we, we need to be seen as a, what we need to put into that handbook as diversity, um, that's another avenue that we can look at. Um, some of these things are uh, governed by contract negotiations and what we have for contracts. So, you know, there's a little bit of um, difference there that we need to uh, look into. So my question is for probably David Nixon. Um, David, is there, because I'm, I'm just not familiar with the rule or, or whatnot, but um, it looks like, are, are we able to have a problem with it, but are we able to appoint a non-Hadley resident to an actual committee? And then the second question is, uh, it looks like, there is somebody that's a Hopkins student, but not yet a registered voter. Are they under 18? Is that why? And are we able to appoint them to a committee? That uh, student is, I can confirm that that student is under 18 and she is a current um, Hopkins student and Hadley resident. Okay. All right. So the first question is uh, whether somebody from out of town can serve on a committee. Uh, there is no statutory requirement that you that you be in the same town as a committee that you volunteer for, so it becomes a matter of choice of the select board. I believe you have somebody on the cultural council who is not a town resident already, so you've established some precedent there. In terms of uh, somebody who is uh, under 18 years of age, again, this is something that uh, is entirely up to the board of selectmen. I don't have a problem with that student being on this committee. She's on the diversity committee at Hopkins Academy. Um, I think it's always good to have a student representative to see what is going on in the school system. Um, so I don't have a problem with that one. Yeah, I, I think it's great. Not only that uh, Amy is volunteering, not even living here, which is awesome, but uh, also... Yeah have young interest and young participation from a student. So that's that's great. I just want to make sure we're... we're As a teacher, I will say that I practically live in Hadley. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm there like, you know, 12 hours a day. <laughs> More time than you are at home. I understand. I'm a very resident of Hadley. There you go. <laughs> All right. So um, can we get a motion for at least appointing members, please? I move that we have... 
appoint all of the people who have applied to membership in this committee. Okay. I'll, I'll second that. Any further discussion? Yeah, I, I'm looking at like three to five members. How many uh, applicants were there? It was like eight, nine. Uh, it looks like there's, if you include Christian as the select board liaison, there's 14, I think. But he, uh, usually the liaison is not really counted as a member, right? As far as. Yeah, I mean, that's tricky. And yeah. I, you know, I guess you could consider like voting, you know, do we need that member, many members for voting? And I, I don't know. I, I don't want to discourage it right now. And I don't really know what we're going to be voting on. So I right. mean, this can be something that's adaptive too. I think that we should let them figure it out themselves and not try to, to solve this problem and let them come back to us with what they think is going to happen. But these people are interested in volunteering for the town, which is always a good thing. Yeah. And let's see what they want to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with it. Yeah, you know, let here. them decide the three. I would, I would still stick with the three to five members and let them decide who they want on the committee. I would say five to seven members, uh, excluding a, a Hopkins Academy student because she's not eligible to vote, but she can offer her uh, suggestions and be, you know, uh, proactive to this committee. Um, so I don't want to exclude her at all. And uh, Amy being a teacher, I would like her because she has the diversity committee, uh, the uh, diversity, um, not the committee, but the, uh, um, say that again, Amy. Club. It's a, it's club. a club. <laughs> God, I'm getting old, Amy. I got, I'm 70 years old. I got a little Alzheimer's setting in here. But, um, but anyway, I would appreciate that you have volunteered to do this. So I certainly would like you to be uh, involved with this also. So I'm, I'm looking at the membership list here too, and you've got, you know, great people on here like Miss Koki uh, from, you know, she was my son's kindergarten teacher and stuff like that. So people that are great contributions to the group. So that's, that's yeah. not the I see with whittling it down uh, too much. I mean, if you don't count Christian as the liaison, you don't count the, um, is it Ada or Ada? Uh, the student? Ada. A Aiden, okay. Um, you know, you drop a couple people off that list, but I think to get down to seven, we're going to, it's going to be a tough decision to make and they volunteered. So why not, you know, where this is basically a one year appointment, I'm assuming. Yeah, basically that's it. Okay. I see right now. Yeah. So, so do we want to align this with all the other committee appointments? So this, this appointment is expiring at the same time or Jennifer is shaking her head. So that's a yes. Like an annual appointment. When, when does, that happen? You can appoint them right now and their term will just expire on June 30th of 2021, the same as all your other annual appointments. And then we can reappoint them as an annual thing. So then that sounds, that sounds good. So then if this doesn't work where we have too many people, then we can make that change next time around and shrink the number of, of members if need be. Yep. And let's uh, think about in the next couple of weeks, uh, what we would like their duties to be. Let's think about that. Right. And we'll present you with some goals, you know, it, maybe not next meeting, but maybe the meeting after that. We'll see. All right. That sounds yeah. good. Christian. Yeah. That sounds good. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? I Hello. Think we, we had a second. Up. All right. Just making sure. And then um, for any further discussion, uh, I just wanted to make a comment that, might be a little bit touchy based on last meeting, but as far as uh, police policies, I'm sure the chief can speak to this a little bit, but not necessarily do we need to have a member of the police department on the committee, but if we're going to be advising on police policies or procedures, it would be great if you could include the department just so that way we're not springing something on them at the last second. So, um, chief. I think I think, David, though, with us giving them, um, they're going to give us a, their goals 
and we're going to either do yay or nay. Uh, we are the policy setting board. Um, so I think, you know, those things need to be to come before us. So I don't think that, you know, that is the, the uh, purview of the diversity committee to set policy for departments that we are in charge of. So some things that we need to take a look at, um, but you know they can make their recommendations, but not necessarily. We we are the ones that need to vote on this. Yeah, I I was uh, I would thank you for saying that, David. Um, that's Joyce. kind of where I was. No, no. Joyce. What when David brought it up originally, and I appreciate that as well, Joyce. Uh, Christian and I have had a couple of different discussions over the course of the last couple of weeks. I don't think that's. Uh, their goal. Uh, um, certainly, they they want to open up lines of communication to to talk about things like that. Uh, just from what I get from talking to Christian, and that was really the only thing I brought it up the last time is is simply to be a resource um, and answer questions and and be involved. But you know, the more that I think about it, uh, you know, I don't know that this committee is is designed simply to talk about law enforcement. So you know, I'm sure that they would be. Uh, willing to bring in, if it has to do with the schools, bring in folks from the school committee. If it has to do with the hiring practices, bring in HR. Um, so that's kind of what I got from my discussion with, with Christian. So, like I said, I, I was simply, I was not offering necessarily to be on the, be a resource in the event that those types of issues came up. So that was that. Was that. Yeah, well, you're I want to make it clear, too, this committee is not operating as an island trying to dictate things to people like we want to involve the police when we have a discussion about the police. And maybe we want to have a discussion without Mike there or a representative from the police department, but we would be inviting them in to have a discussion before any kind of decisions or anything was made. I mean, it's kind of meant to... Um, be a venue to discuss discuss issues and be an open conversation. And um, well, that's it would never be my intention to do anything behind anybody's back. They would be involved with well, the decision, is, and we'd be coming to the board with a with a proposal. Miss uh, Andrea had something she wanted to say. I just wanted to also let the select board know that the committee has um, and has already done and will continue to do research of other municipalities in Massachusetts that have formed these committees. Um, and they serve at the pleasure of the town and of their select boards or other governing bodies. So um, there definitely um, are some uh, examples already of how these committees have operated within their town um, in a way that you know, is just bringing this issue up uh, so that it's something that the, you know, it's like a lens for the select board to look through, I think. Um, if I could just distill uh, where the committee um, is seeing themselves being able to serve the select board in the town. And that we will hopefully collaborate with other um, similar committees that you know, work throughout the state of Massachusetts and, and pick up best, best practices and that sort of thing. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, any further discussion before uh, Jennifer has something? Can I just ask for clarification? Christian will be the liaison and Ada, the, the high school student, will be a non-voting member of the committee. Is that correct? Correct. And also uh, the teacher will be a non-voting member so she is not a Hadley resident, but certainly will be anything that she says will be taken under consideration. And the, then you'll also do that for Koki Mulugeta, who I believe is also a not a Hadley resident. Christian, is that correct? That's, cor that's correct. Yep. So both of the school representatives will be non-voting participa participatory members. Is that correct? Sure. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Any further discussion? No. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Did, we, did we come up with a number or we're doing them all? But this is for all of them. All until, of them? Until, until, until. You had mentioned seven and I had mentioned three or five. 
but then three of them are non-voting, John. No, I understand that. It's just okay. That, that's a that's an awful lot of a lot of people. Well, they can all chit chat and bring us whatever they need to bring us to uh, any policies and procedures, and we can discuss that with them. The more ideas, the better. A lot of times, too. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Hi. Hey, John. No, right. uh, no, I was thinking about it. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks everybody for volunteering, and please say thank you to that student for stepping up. That's awesome. So. Ab absolutely. Thank Ada. David, you need to unmute yourself. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Seven point three cell phone agreement for the building inspector because I see he's hanging out here waiting for this. So uh, he's uh, asking a stipend of fifty dollars a month uh, to have the, the cell phone. Tom, do you want to talk about uh, why you're asking for that? It was um, just it was discussed with um, Ed O'Connor when I had first um, was sitting down, you know, negotiating. I guess you would say it. Um, I don't know if uh, Chief Mike um, Mike Enables available. He had one other option that um, he could just suggest to the uh, board if he is there. Yeah, I'm here. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I had brought it up at the last meeting about working with Verizon. We can actually utilize Tom's phone and separate his work phone from his private phone on a single phone. Uh, I just have not had a chance to follow up with Verizon with my uh, mm -hmm. surgery. Um, so I'll, I'll get on that if that's acceptable still. So uh, either way, I'm all for not having to buy another town phone that costs a lot of money. So um, I think it's a good option, but um, do we want to approve either or and see what yes. I'll make a motion. <laughs> to have either or, uh, whichever, if Mike can get a deal, that's fine. If not, 50 bucks is okay. Is there a second. second. Okay, second. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so thank you. Uh, Mount Holyoke range conservation restriction. As soon as it loads, um, this is for the reservoir land, correct? That's correct. All right, so that has finally been made its way through the state legislature, and we're ready to sign off on that. And so, what do we need to do? Just vote to accept this? That's right. So moved. All right. Second. All right. All those in uh, any further discussion? Uh, that 97 land has been uh, approved for uh, Zaterka and... That's not in this motion. No, I know. That's coming up, though. Yeah, so do this motion first, John. All right. Christian did something. I, I was going to ask the same question John just asked, if, if that decision was somehow included with this. But it's it sounds it's, like not, it's it not included in this motion. All those in favor of the reservoir and surrounding lands resolution. Aye. 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 No. No. Okay. Uh, four, one. Jesus. I have my perfect record. Oh, Lord, help you. So back, back to the uh, uh, North Hadley Village Hall and Zaturka Park. The Yahoo! They did Yahoo! It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did approve removing Article 97 from uh, the North Hadley Village ball field. And so David is working to get that sale closed ASAP. And they also added Article 97 protection to Zaturka Park. So that will be permanently a park now. Is, is the previous buyer still interested? Yes. Excellent. Yep. Joyce will celebrate. You absolutely, I don't have to pray to the gods anymore. Just keep the matches away from her, that's all. Burn it off. <laughs> yeah, good thing you didn't burn it down, Joyce. I you don't have any yourself. matches in my possession. I got, what are those lighters called? The one of those. Bix. 
Don't we... worry. I'm not that vengeance. Why Don't work. We... When are we moving into the new station? It's soon to so come. To get to that for updates here. <laughs> Fire station, library, senior center updates. Joyce, yeah, what are you doing? Well, we, we, all, the only thing that I have tonight is, of course, there's a couple of things that need to get finished. Um, but the one thing is, is that the uh, fiber optic, we, which we have generously, uh, since we had some extra money in our budget to do the other town meetings, we just had a little bit of a snafu. We got about $35,000. Is that correct, Mike? Are you Mike, talking about the, uh, the addition to it? Uh, the addition, there's like $35,000 more to the fiber optic uh, yeah. uh, that we already that? approved. We already approved the $100,000 uh, that would take care of the rest of the town buildings, but there's been a little bit of an increase. No, actually, the the original project was uh, just over ninety, and that was for running uh, the fiber optics from the center station to the north station. Correct. The additional funding is to add on the senior center, the library, the old library, and the town hall. Uh, yeah. so they will also be networked into this, uh, which should, in the long term, show a substantial cost savings for us. Yeah. So we just needed to have the select board approve the additional money for the uh, fiber optics so that we can move forward with this. If they can do that tonight, I would appreciate it. I can make a motion to approve the fiber optic change order. I'll second. Okay. And I just want to say I applaud the fire chief for uh, not only solving the problems of the new fire station, but also the rest of the town's communication problems at the same time. It'll be nice to have a connection that actually works around town. So. Even Jennifer's applauding over here on camera, so there you go. <laughs> well, you know, I think with a project, if you have extra money and they can benefit the rest of the town, then that's what we need to do. All right. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So my, my question is, is that we'll be coming into the fall and uh, Mike, you can chime in on it. Uh, we still have some lawn maintenance that needs to get done by Omasta, but that won't get done until the fall. And I, I think maybe coordinating all of the openings uh, so that maybe we can do all of them in one day. I know the library is on track for the fall, the senior center. Uh, I would like to maybe have this a grand type of thing that we have completion of these buildings. Is anybody else thinking about that? Mr. Chairman, just, just uh, Joyce, just so you know, we are, we are still receiving equipment. So they're working on the radio communications right now. So yep. we don't have, we don't have the stuff yet in the station. The building yep. itself is pretty close to complete. Um, but we're just awaiting uh, completion of the, uh, the backup dispatch console and then receiving uh, the furniture and equipment. So that's where we're at. Uh, we're looking at probably the beginning of September, but we would be happy to be a part of that uh, program that you're talking about. Well, I'm actually looking at September as being an opening for all of the buildings. So if all of those things can get into place, uh, Jane and um, Haley at the, at the library, if things are in where they are, you know, how we always have the... Uh, uh, senators or our representatives uh, coming out and uh, doing the grand opening. It would certainly be nice to do all three of them at once since we kind of did all of these buildings um, in conjunction with one another. Somehow they all ended up being completed at the same time. I think it would be nice if we could do one grand opening of all three buildings. I don't know how everybody else feels about that. Well, let's let's try to work out some details and maybe aim yeah. for like mid to late September after uh, we get done with the UMass mess. Remember all the students coming back and, and yeah, 
And that was that was the other thing too. I you know, let's finish with the buildings and then I'll chime in on that area. But Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm totally for it. It's just how do we manage it in this time? You know, if we have a big group of people going to three different buildings, it seems like it's gonna be tough to manage and stay within all our guidelines. So you know, I think I think that we'll be able to do it if everybody does safety, um, mask and things like that. I think I think we'll be okay. Let's see what happens by the fall and see what we what will happen then. Or not, I was thinking on some details. Christian, like uh, springtime or something, if we get through this whole epidemic, you know. Yeah, let's Let let's see how let's then. let's do tentative for the fall, and if yeah. not, then we'll move it move it back. Sounds that's good. good. We did tentative for May. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah. We're all doing tentative, Jane, for sure. <laughs> Maybe we can get the governor if we do all three buildings together farther out. I yeah. think that's true. You know, yeah, we're I, more likely to, with with that much action going on in this town, yeah. we ought to get even, even, a, even the 1st of October, seeing where we are at that, you know, skip September and head for October 1st or that area and see see how things go at that point. As long as you don't try to make it Halloween on me, Joyce. Oh, trick or treat. <laughs> it's okay, David. It'll be in the daytime. <laughs> so, uh, senior Center, Jane, anything there? Yes, I have a question for the select board and the DPW, and that is we cannot get our plantings properly dealt with with the water band because anybody who's putting in new shrubs or lawns, and ours are going to have to be redone in September because the lawn didn't get in in time, needs daily watering. And how do we, as a town representative building, deal with that? So we, we can't, I know that, we can't uh, just water as long as the band is up, unfortunately. Um, I'm, I'm meeting Chris on Friday, so let me check on the, maybe with some of the rain we've gotten recently, we may be getting closer to getting out of this uh, drought status or whatever it is. So well, and the other question is, I know that there's an agricultural exemption. So does somehow new planting qualify as agriculture slash growth? No, unfortunately, that's, that's just uh, agriculture is growing the plants for, you know, like the nursery, uh, a farmer, that kind of stuff. Unfortunately. I was trying. I know, I know. Good try. <laughs> but. <laughs> but, but Jane, those, those plantings can be watered at a certain time of the day. Yeah, so we we yeah. could water those plants. Uh, I, I don't I don't recollect the time frame, but we can do it either after in the evening or early morning. That no, those you can't do it midday. You can't do it midday. No, you don't want to anyway. Right, exactly. But we don't have a sprinkler system on ours, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, let, let me check with the water department and Chris and see what we can figure out. Maybe some of that has changed as far as the restrictions or will change. That's um, what I was going to, that's what I was going to ask you, David, just see where we are with how much water we're uh, putting out for the DPW. Well, I, I can tell you that for a while there and John probably knows the ac actual numbers, but we were like at uh, 1.3 or 1.5 million gallons a day. Yeah, we were over a million. That's when they put the ban on. Yeah something like 500,000 after right after the ban was put in place. So they, it, it had quite a effect. So we might be able to lift the band and do uh, even, or even I, odd. So a lot of that comes from the state, not necessarily right here in this area. Uh, they, yep. All the water departments meet and discuss the, the status of the water shortage or the drought. Nope. But nobody else around us has a water ban. Well, the, the state mandates us per pump, per drawdown per pump, how much water we're pumping out of that well. Okay. Thanks, John. But I'll, I'll check and I'll, I'll get back. I'll, I should know by Friday afternoon. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Christian, the library. Yeah, I don't have a ton of updates. I mean, it's moving forward. Um, you know, it's looking... I forget when the day of completion is, uh, you know, 
not too far in the distant future. It's really coming together. Probably people here know more about it than me. Tommy's probably over there more than me uh, looking at the building, but uh, I know that we probably awarded the uh, landscaping contract. David probably knows more about that than me right now. Um, but a big thing too is just working out the solar for the building and trying to figure out um, the budget for that. I had a meeting with Linda, or we had a meeting with Linda last week uh, discussing the solar. So things are moving along, but still decisions to be made and uh, things to figure out. So, uh, Christian, where are they with the getting the reimbursement for the solar? Yeah, that that's the thing is we, with the lead certification, if we get that, then we automatically get a hundred thousand dollar reimbursement from Massachusetts Library Building Commission or whatever the exact acronym is. Um, yeah. So that would be if we do the solar. And there was some questioning just on like the flow, cash flow of the whole project, where we needed to meet with Linda to figure it all out. Um, okay. So they have they're not going ahead with the solar at this point. Again, we're still looking at all the numbers and that kind of thing. We would okay. really like to go forward with the solar, but the size of array requires a special permit and yeah. some different things. So, you know, it will be, it'll take a little longer than like the senior center project was, I think a 25 kilowatt array or less. And so that could happen pretty quickly, but the library array I believe is like 65 kilowatts. So it's, big enough where you need a special permit to get that. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're working on it. So yeah. Okay. In process. Okay. Um, anything else on the buildings before we move along to announcements? Nope. Okay. Any announcements? I just have one passing and that's Nancy Morowski. Um, she is a local resident that had lived in town most of her life. So condolences to her family. Um, the other thing I was going to do for announcements were um, there's a coalition of people that are questioning the return of the students. And I don't think Hadley has turned in, has uh, chimed in on that really. I've been so tempted to, send an email to Baker, but I can't get on his line. I know Jennifer's tried to hook me up. Um, I really have concerns about uh, being unindated with students returning to this area all at the same time from UMass, Amherst, Hampshire, Holyoke, Smith. Everybody's coming back on the 23rd or the 24th of August. And I think that our town has been asked to chime in on that in Amherst, and I don't know if David has any update on that or all, at all, because I'm concerned about that. Smith College is gonna be online only. They're not returning. And okay. I, I believe the governor said these are all, these comebacks are only at 50%, right? They're only at 50%, but my, my concern is, is that I don't care. I think that colleges should make, um, only have the states that we have around us allowing these students to come back, not bringing in, in students from Texas and Florida and California and all those states that are hot spots. I'm really having concern about people coming in from hot spots. David, do you have anything on that from UMass? Yeah, so I met with uh, UMass last Friday, uh, and one of the things that I asked is that Hadley have a place at the table with uh, that meeting with uh, the town of Amherst. Uh, so I can follow up and find out where our, our, our uh, ask for the place at the table may be. Okay, is, and when is that meeting taking place? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I think it's a series of meetings. I was also on a meeting with uh, the police chief, um, David Nixon, and a group of UMass people, I guess Molly was on that too, kind of figuring out what their plans are uh, for um, reopening and their 50% capacity on campus. Now off campus, there's no restriction and it's remote learning only. So 
we could potentially have a lot of college kids in our community with nothing going on um, other than getting together, but that's being presumptive. But I remember being a college student and what I wanted to do at that time. So who knows right. what um, they will do. And, uh, you know, we, there's an article in the paper about Amherst having a, a task force with UMass um, about, about off-campus housing and all these things, but there was no mention of Hadley. So, I mean, I did talk to David about seeing what we could do to be on that committee or possibly form another committee where it was us and Sunderland or some other neighboring community to deal with well, the university. But it is, it is scary, I guess, is the right word of what's going to happen. It is because I, I worry about that. I, I watch the numbers every day. I watch what's going on in all the other states about how we are not allowing within the uh, New England states, New York and Connecticut, uh, you know, New Jersey about people coming from hot spots this way and what we're having to do to quarantine. So, you know, I think we need to be aware of this because a lot of our houses here in Hadley are rented to outside students and not necessarily from Massachusetts. So that's my concern. We, you know, we do have a lot of rental property in Hadley. Yeah, and they, they in the meetings that I've been involved with, they didn't talk about quarantining, you know, or anything. So like when students yeah. get here, I don't know if there's any kind of system to, you know, log if they're quarantining, where they're from, you know, there's no real transparency with that information. The only thing we have is if they fly into the airport in Connecticut and they have to, you know, uh, show proof of a COVID-19 or they have to quarantine for 14 days when coming into Massachusetts. So they have to abide by some of these rules when they fly into Connecticut. The Board of Health, I see Susan on there. What are what are they, uh, you, have you people been talking about it, Board of Health? Is she still there? The, uh, yeah, Board of Health is still here. Although I have to say, you guys sure throw a heck of a meeting here. Uh, <laughs> it's like past my bedtime. Uh, Me too. <laughs> the, uh, well, you know, the state has the uh, travel ban advisory uh, in place now where everyone who comes into Massachusetts who is not from uh, a low prevalence uh, state is required to fill out an online form and uh, say where they are, where they're going to quarantine, what their contact information is, um, and uh, the state will be checking in with them by text. Uh, uh, there's no way to really enforce this, to, to be perfectly honest. I mean, the other thing is, you know, our hotels. The hotels are, their responsibility is to tell somebody when they check in what the rules are. But there's, there's nobody, you know, if the state finds out that somebody hasn't followed the rules, then there are, you know, significant fines. But I think we can uh, rest assured that uh, many students coming to our area from uh, high uh, COVID dense uh, areas uh, will not be quarantining. Well, that makes us that makes us sad for sure, doesn't it, Susan? What's that? That makes us sad. It makes it makes us sad that they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. The students, the state, yeah. you know, the students. You know, I here's what I say. I mean, if you put a three year old in a candy store, you can't really tell them that they can't have any candy. <laughs> I think that uh, you know to expect young people, you know, we've all been that age to you know yeah. abide by these kinds of restrictions is uh, not realistic. Uh, which segues into why the Board of Health has 
has uh, you know had uh, discussions and uh, the mandatory mask rule. Mm -hmm. We have to be so careful here in Hadley. Yeah. So that when you have your command meeting next week, we will delve into that more for sure. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Any other announcements? All right. Uh, we'll see you again on the 19th. And if I could get a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Hallelujah. Aye. <laughs> have, have a good couple.